Welcome to the future. Welcome to Food is the Future. My name is Ndidi Munali, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this event, the first of two today, jointly organized by youth organizations around the world and supported by CARE, EAT, WWF, GAIN, ICCAD, and the Club of Rome. Before we start, I want to share a few practical things with you. First, this event is being simultaneously translated into all six UN languages. You can access the different language channels on the Act for Food, Act for Change YouTube channel. Also, you can share your questions and thoughts with us directly on the Act for Food, Act for Change YouTube and Facebook channel that we will monitor for Q&A. Please also use the hashtag Hashtag food is the future on social media. This morning, we'll be joined by speakers and audience from across the world. We'll hear from politicians, scientists, those who have been active in the action tracks, and most importantly, youth representatives, all participating interactively. We'll learn more about how people look back at the UN FSS process and what game-changing ideas have emerged. We will look forward to what we hope that the summit will bring us tomorrow discuss the initiatives that will carry the agenda forward and get in a better understanding of how the UNFSS is relevant for all global debates. We'll talk about the key choices that need to be made to move cities, communities, countries, and citizens to accelerate movements that nourish both people and planet, and we'll examine how we can translate this into concrete action. And most importantly, we'll hear from so many of you, passionate and committed young leaders from around the world, and the recommendations and priorities that you want to see coming out of the UN Food System Summit process. Thank you for joining us around this global table to talk about how to unleash the power of food to build a better future for all. My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli, and I'm the co-founder of Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition, Ace Foods, and founder of Nourishing Africa. And I'm joining you from Lagos, Nigeria. My co-pilot today is Sophie Healy. So over to you, Sophie. Thank you, Nididi. It is so exciting to be here today. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophie Healy Thao, and I am a youth leader and youth activist with Act for Food, Act for Change. It is a pleasure also to welcome you to this session and to be co piloting the session with the amazing Nididi. Um, but first of all, we would love to hear and learn about you, um, everybody watching at home and around the globe. Where are you listening from? And for that, we have a poll through the online tool called Mentimeter. To access the poll, you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and enter the code on screen, 1007-8637. Three seven into your phone or your browser, and it's easy and it's really easy to follow along from there. So while you're logging in to Mentimeter and putting your results on the screen, um, I'll let you know where I'm from. I'm from Ireland, uh, the south of Ireland to be exact, in a really small fishing town. But today I'm joining you from Geneva in Switzerland. Um, Nadidi, where are you joining us from? Hi again, I'm joining from Lagos, Nigeria. It's a rainy morning in Lagos today, uh, but obviously the rain is good for agriculture and food. So we're happy that we always have the rain in the rainy season. Great to see you all and all the diversity of people joining us from all over the world. Welcome. Well, some of our speakers are really, really diverse. I think we'll be traveling right across the globe today as we meet them. We have speakers from Bangladesh, Uganda, Myanmar, Italy, India, China, Zimbabwe, and so many other countries. Um, and now we can see a few of the poll results. Ooh, we have a lot of people from Europe, but Asia is catching up. And then we have some people from Oceania and South America. Wow, it's great to have everybody here today from so many different diverse backgrounds. Um, and cultures and food cultures, which is why we're here today to talk about our food system. But first of all, I would like to um, welcome the very first moderator of the day who will be introducing our first high level contributions 
the incredible Cherry Atilano, who is a really, really big role model of mine. She is the CEO and president of Agria Agricultural Systems, has been a very active member of the United Nations Food Systems Summit Champions Network. Cherry, my role model, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophie. Sending you love from the farm. You see my background, it's all lush and green. I'm in the middle of the Philippines in the island of Marinduque. And thank you for you know looking up to me as a role model. I was sharing with you that it seems we've been meeting three days in a row already to support the UN Food Systems uh, uh, Summit, but more importantly, a lot of you know health and uh, hunger and nutrition issues all over the world. And thank you so much for this event and for the invitation to be a moderator. Uh, I know it will be exciting and you will learn a lot from our high level speakers. So for today, we will first listen to a video message from Ms. Amina J. Mohammed, the UN Deputy Secretary General, where she will share with you why she believes this event is so important. Please uh, share the video. Thank you. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, Thank you to the Food Systems Summit Youth Constituency and the chairs of the Action Tracks for organizing this important event. We have a unique opportunity to shape the future of our food systems. When the Secretary General called for a Food Systems Summit nearly two years ago, our motivation was to change gears and really accelerate action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs are, above all, about transforming our present to create a better future and the future belongs to the young. That is why we have been so committed to ensure that young people have a leadership role throughout the entire process. Today, we are reaping the rewards. Together, we have facilitated an inclusive process and leveraged the power of our collective ideas. We have brought new actors to the table and put their concerns and ideas on the table. Our new approach to multi-stakeholder leadership engaged over 100,000 people across the world to think through what sustainable food systems should look like in their own unique context. The integration of youth and the leadership of the summit's action tracks, champions networks and independent dialogues is a great example of co-leadership and a model for future global processes. I have personally been inspired by young people bringing their perspectives and solutions on how we can shape a better food future for all. And I was pleased to learn that the youth declaration at the pre-summit recognized the right of everyone, everywhere to a healthy diet, a cornerstone of our collective efforts to realize the SDGs. Young people are not waiting to take action and make a difference. They are stepping up and speaking up for equitable, sustainable, healthy, and resilient food systems. Ahead of tomorrow's UN Food System Summit, we count on everyone to keep up the momentum. Together, we can transform food systems and create the world we want and need. Thank you. Thank you very much, DSG. It was so great to hear a message from you, Ms. Amina Mohammed. And always, you know, it's so beautiful to hear that the future of food is the young and they are not waiting on what to do. They're really there as frontliners to change our food systems. Now, I would like to invite Marie Claire Graf, youth advocate, UN Youth Climate Champion of Switzerland, an active member of the Act for Food, Act for Change Youth Initiative, to share her vision on the importance of the summit. The floor is yours, Marie. Thank you so much, Cherry, and also thank you so much, Amina, um, for this for this very um, heartwarming words. And it means a lot um, to have this co-leadership. As you already mentioned, Cherry, I had the pleasure to work together with the summit um, for, for the last couple of years. But also I would like to say that this is not my vision. This is what we collectively have been achieving. This is what we have been advocating for. And there have been hundreds of young people who have been working since, since one and a half years on, on our shared vision. And we have been also reaching out to young people on various, um, in various parts of the world, we have been uh, doing various processes to gather um, the views of over 50,000 young people uh, to come up with the vision and also what we are committing to and um, what we are demanding because at the end we cannot do it alone. And I think the vision is something fairly simple, but because we see that how broken our food system is and what we basically want to have is a food system where we are 
again like back on track right we want to have a food system which is nourishing us the people but also nourishing uh the planet also nourishing everything what we know and for this we really have to transform and i think this is is the very crucial point that we as young people also as amina mohammed said before we do not want we can't wait we want to be part of it we want to be part of this process and that's why we have been working um all together over the over the last months and years and we are hungry for this change honestly we like we can all, we, we, we don't have the passion <laughs> we don't have the patience to wait any longer but we have the passion and the drive to make these changes happen and that is our vision that we as a young generation as we have been part of this process now that we are also further in, engaged in the implementation because at the end we have been coming up with a nice vision, we have been coming up with demands, we're coming up with what we are committing to, but what we now need are the implementation, and now is the actions, right? And this is exactly where we need the young people, and we do need young people everywhere, on the ground, being right there and doing this transformation with all the generations together, because we as young people, we cannot do it alone, neither can it other generations. So for, for our vision, um, we need the commitment of everyone. We are very committed. We have been committing to raising awareness on various topics, on health, nutrition, sustainable diets, um, on working with communities. We have been um, committing to support the ad advocacy on a global stage when it comes to climate biodiversity, um, but also for fair um, and decent wages for, for the people working within the food system. But to achieve all of this, I'm asking you to, sh to come and join our vision and make it our global vision uh, that we can strive for. But as already mentioned, we have a youth declaration where everything is also lined out in details. And yeah, it's an open invitation to everyone here to support the young people and um, do it all with us together. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you very much, Marie, for that beautiful message. And, you know, as a young person myself, I'm so happy that a lot of young people are really, you know, taking a responsibility and accountability in moving forward our food systems. And next, we would like to hear from Mr. Saber Hossein Chudhari, MP and Chairperson of Parliamentary Standing Committee on Ministry of Environment, forest and climate change bangladesh he will share his remarks straight after we will hear a response by miss omya omrani medical doctor liaison officer for public health issues at the international federation of medical students associations please take the floor thank you <clears throat> thank you so much uh, jerry and uh, uh, we are early afternoon here in in Dhaka, bangladesh so greetings to everyone. I know we have a global audience. Um, it's my real pleasure to be with you today and uh, express solidarity uh, with the vision of the youth that has just been outlined. Uh, I think Amina was very eloquent and uh, she laid out the scene really. Uh, so the way that I look at it as a parliamentarian, uh, the first thing is that we can't have business as usual. Um, uh, so we are looking at what are we looking at when we talk about uh, sustainable uh, food uh, systems. I think we are looking at uh, new ways of, uh, of producing and delivering sufficient food, safe food, and nutritious food. I think that's, that's very important. Um, and, and we need to take an integrated and holistic approach. Now, when we talk about that, we of course know that each country is different. So, you know, we have to take into account the local circumstances. There is no one size that fits all. Um, and food, when we say that food is the future, of course, food has what has sustained and nourished a civilization um, over the years, over the decades, over the millions of years. Um, so it has always been critical uh, to our survival in this planet. In the past, it continues to be vitally important. And when we look to the future, we know that it's going to be a very different world. We already see that. We are aware of climate change. We are aware of uh, biodiversity. Uh, we are aware of the way we are using planetary resources. Um, we are aware of the importance of uh, regenerating agriculture. So I think all of these things uh, create, of course, a very challenging context. Uh, and then we have had the recent experience with COVID-19, a global pandemic, and how that has really disrupted uh, the food security system. I mean, even in Bangladesh, we saw it. So uh, we talk about resilience uh, and we talk about building back better. And I think what is important there is when we talk about resilience, there are really uh, three components, if I may say it that way. Uh, first is our ability to absorb and withstand 
the shocks and stresses. And these are environmental, they are social, they are economic. Um, and once we have done that, how do we recover quickly? So the first, I talk about the three R's. One is resist, one is recover, and the other is regenerate. So we have to withstand the initial stress and the shock. Then we have to have the ability to recover. And then we regenerate and go to a higher level of resilience. I think you know that's the sort of uh, food system that we are looking at. And uh, it requires um, collaboration. It requires partnerships across the board. And I think we as parliamentarians have a very important responsibility in articulating policy. And then, of course, looking at legislative frameworks, uh, looking how we can appropriate resources through the financial process. And is all of this, uh, because it's, it's a huge, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's really a, a puzzle uh, trying to put all the pieces together. I think the young people play an incredibly important role because the future that we are trying to construct, the future that we are trying to leave behind uh, is really one that is for the young people. They are going to be the most impacted for the longest duration of time. So it is vitally important that they not only have a seat at the table, um, that they enrich the discussions, they shape the discourse, uh, because it is after all their future um, that uh, we are deciding for. So I think um, I really welcome this initiative. It is absolutely right that young people should be there. Um, and we should not just invite them and they be silent spectators at the table. We should listen to them. And then we should fashion our policies um, accordingly. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much for um, your support. And I really couldn't agree more. With COVID-19, we've seen how it has exposed the vulnerability of our food systems, as well as the ongoing threat to nutrition security that we have seen, especially to our health, uh, the health of the current and the future generation. I also agree with um, Mr. Sober in terms of we would not be able to shape a resilient, as you mentioned, and sustainable food system without the meaningful and consistent participation of young people who are really the first line responders to the needs of our community. And I believe that it is imperative, as you have mentioned, that we the youth perspectives are integrated both uh, throughout the three R's and at the same time on a local and a global policy making level. Uh, in a way to, to shape resilient food systems, as well as, and more importantly, the shift towards sustainable and nutrition uh, dietary uh, change. Um, I want to just take a few moments to really uh, highlight two important call to actions at all decision makers and policy makers um, like you uh, for the meaningful engagement of youth. It's really important to always have and organize um, uh, intergenerational dialogues with young people, not just on a global level, but more importantly, on a national level. Uh, such uh, dialogues can generate uh, outcome-oriented uh, policy frameworks that really have youth uh, needs at heart. And at the same time, it's important to consider, to support, as well as invest in innovative youth-led initiatives that look at um, the uh, transformation towards nutritious, sustainable uh, dietary shifts, and at the same time, uh, support and combat the um, challenges that we as young people face, like advertisement of uh, unnutritious and processed foods. These are just a few examples of what can be done. And this brings me to a question that I would like to uh, kindly ask you. Um, it has two parts. The first is that, will you commit to working with young people towards shaping resilient, as you have mentioned, and sustainable food systems that place our health as a current and future generation and the health of the environment at heart beyond our short interview today? And the second part of my question would be, if yes, what would be the first action that, we, that you would do towards the meaningful engagement of young people? Thank you so much, Omnia. And you know, I think when you talk about transformation, uh, what is important to keep in mind is we are really reimagining development. I think that is something very important. So uh, it's not like going on the basis of, of what has worked and what we have done over the years. And uh, so how can we be change makers? I think that's really the important question. And of course, it is going to be the young people. So I think the first thing is raising awareness amongst the young people that this is their future. You know, They need to take charge of their own future. I think that is fundamentally important. And quite often I find that you know young people either they are not interested enough 
Uh, of course, the voices that I listen to today are very passionate, but there are people. And I think there is uh, what I find very, uh, very hopeful is that there is an increasing awareness and a realization on the part of the young generation uh, that they really can't be silent spectators. So the first thing is, I think, building awareness, uh, motivating them, inspiring them. And not even national, you know, I would actually look at a very, I would go down as grassroots as possible. I would, uh, I would be quite keen to start at my own constituency level. You know, there are 300 electoral constituencies in Bangladesh and start the dialogue. I think what is important is starting the dialogue, giving them the confidence, giving them the faith, giving them the trust that yes, what you say really matters and we'll take that into account. And, and I always believe that we start with small steps. You know, there's no point in imagining something which is very grand, national across the board. So let us have some small steps, incremental steps, get the young people involved, and nothing succeeds like success. And I think, you know, that in turn will inspire other young people. And in terms of commitment, you know, it's not just uh, saying a few words um, in a sort of uh, a virtual session globally, but I think it's what we do on the ground that matters. And as I've said, what we do on the ground is going to be local action. We take into account our own local context. There is no one size that fits all. The solution we will have in Bangladesh may be very different from what we have in Lagos or the Philippines. Um, but I think the important thing is the process. And if we get the process right, I think the outcomes are going to be there, certainly, for sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Shadhari and Ms. Omrani. That's a very insightful first session. I love the three R's, uh, Mr. Shadhari, the recover, regenerate, and resilience. But more than that, he added another fourth R, raising awareness for the youth to really take ownership of their future. Next up, we want to focus more on agriculture and food systems. We would like to invite His Excellency Minister Charlie McConnell, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Marine of Ireland, to join us. He will share his vision on the UN Food Systems Summit, after which we will hear a response from Mr. Kamotina Tomibaze, Young Farmers Champions Network, formerly Young Farmers Coalition of Uganda, and One Young World Ambassador. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sherry. And uh, it's a pleasure to join you this morning and to be with everyone attending this session and the Food is, uh, the food is the Future event. Um, I look forward to our discussion um, on the role of, of youth in food systems and food systems transformation. The global food system faces many challenges, we know, Sherry, and anyone who has engaged with the UN Food Systems Summit process will have seen this widely recognized and acknowledged. I was delighted to be able to participate extensively in the pre-summit in Rome last July. The concept of sustainable food systems and the need to transfer, transform our systems nationally and globally is now well established. Ireland recently published a new stakeholder-led strategy for agri-food sector called Food Vision 2030. It was developed using a, a food systems approach, recognizing interconnectedness of policies for food, health, climate, and the environment. I believe it is a landmark for the Irish agri-food sector and has indeed the potential to transform our agriculture, food, forestry and marine sectors in the period up to 2030, with sustainability very much at its core. Food Vision is honest and upfront about the challenges we face ahead. Crucially, it proposes solutions to these and charts a pathway to sustainability in all its dimensions, environmental, economic and social. We believe that by following this pathway, we can become a world leader in sustainable food systems. The national dialogues we've had have been a unique part of preparations for the summit and were invaluable to us nationally, as well as discussing sustainable food systems and aligning out our national strategy. The dialogues covered topics such as health and well-being of people and society and aligning domestic and foreign policy towards sustainable food systems. But if I focus area on our youth engagement, the dialogue of, on, on promoting an inclusive food system for the future reinforced the tremendous capacity and innovative thinking of our youth food systems leaders. I believe that we need to facilitate the voices of youth to be fully heard and to allow them to fully participate in debates related to agriculture and food systems. Half the world is under 30 years of age. 
They will have to live with the consequences of decisions taken today longer than anyone else, but they have relatively little uh, say in how the decisions are made and, wh and, and what those decisions are, which is why policymakers and leaders of today must identify new opportunities for leaders of tomorrow to be actively engaged. To quote a young Irish food systems advocate, transformation of food systems is a responsibility, not an action of choice. To enable this, the, the, this food systems transformation must listen to young people. We will need to do more than just mentioning young people in speeches. We need to show up for them. And that is what Ireland intends to do. The agri-food sector wants to engage with children, students and all young people in this regard, our Food Vision 2030 recommends that a working group be established to consider how best this might be done, including the sector convening a youth summit. So building on the experience of the National Food Systems Dialogues, Ireland, Ireland will continue the, the culture of dialogue and stakeholder engagement. And this is one of the biggest lessons learned from our engagement, Sherry, with the UN Food Systems Summit. Thanks. I think you're muted, uh, Kamotima. I think oh, you're yes. muted. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the work you have been doing, uh, ensuring that the voice of young people is in, is put at the core in your planning and execution of different programs. And I would like to commend you for saying that youth, uh, you need to show up for them, not just to. Uh, talk about them without really supporting them. Uh, but also we understand that however much uh, we engage youth in policy planning and implementation, the challenges uh, that are critical, like uh, for example, access to land, uh, access to financing, access to markets remain big issue in terms of attracting young people into farming. And I think uh, we need to synergize more to find ways of uh, working with government, financial institutions, so that we can ensure young people access finance, uh, support young people to add value to their products, so that they can also earn bigger value for their products and be able to influence the food systems. Um, but I would also like to ask, uh, uh, the question, uh, how do you think we can continue to interest young people in agribusiness uh, to keep engaged in, in the business? Uh, and with your experience uh, from Ireland, how do you think we can continue to support this? Thank you. Thank you, Kamatima, and it's, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and thanks very much for your, your, your comments and um, uh, uh, messages. We need to thank you, Matima, to, to educate all our citizens, but particularly our young people where our food come, on where our food comes from, and also how we engage with food systems on a, on a daily basis. Young people have a critical role in shaping sustainable production and consumption, and forging new connections between rural and urban society. We need to teach our young people in school about food, about its composition, its nutritional values, and it's linked to healthy diets and to good well-being. We also need to help our young people, and from an early age, to understand the environmental, social, and economic costs of food waste and food loss. Education and training, I think, is key to bridging the growing disconnect we've seen between young people and the sustainable production and consumption of food. As we adopt a, a food systems approach to our food production and consumption as a means of delivering the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, we must support our young primary producers who will play a central role in the transition to a more sustainable food system. I think we need to provide more opportunities for young farmers to develop their capacity and their knowledge base through formal and indeed vocational training and the provision of agriculture, agriculture services. As demonstrated during Ireland's national dialogues, the potential for food system transformation through research and innovation is endless, particularly with respect to the bioeconomy. Um, and developed countries should share their agri-food experience and expertise with countries in the global south. And for example, Ireland supports Irish agri-business companies through the Africa Agri-Food Development Programme to develop partnerships 
was nascent African companies le leveraging that experience and, and, and expertise. And finally, I, I would also say, Kamatima, um, that networks like yours, or indeed like Macroneferma here in Ireland, have a critical role to play it, by supporting the, the social, economic, cultural, personal development and well-being of young people who have a rural connection, including young farmers. And that is really important to having an ag a vibrant agri-business sector. Thank you very much, Minister Mazzanella and uh, mi Mr. Tommy Baze. What I'm taking here is transformation of our food system is a responsibility, not a choice. And as mentioned also by uh, Mr. Tommy Baze, nothing about us without us. So as we take care of our responsibility for the future, we need to be involved in not only in high level dialogue, but also in grassroots dialogue and intervention. Thank you. And lastly, we are honored to have with us today the World Food Prize Laureate 2021, Ms. Shakuntala Thilstead. Ms. Thilstead is a global lead for nutrition and public health at World Fish. She will be joined by Maithi Newmon, Indigenous people's rights activist from Myanmar. Maithi, please start by telling us what you think of the UN Food System Summit project. Thank you, Cherry. Um, so as an indigenous youth coming from a farming, which is a producer family and living in a city, which is predominantly consumer community and working with indigenous and other producer farmer communities for almost a decade, and also a climate advocate for inclusive policy making both at the national level and international arena for more than half a decade. Um, the UNFSS process gave me a very high hope and really big learnings from my engagement throughout the process. Uh, I have been amazed by how the Special Envoy and her team, the Secretariat and all other leading agencies have tried so hard to bring in so many different stakeholder groups within the food system to be engaged in the process. Um, so. I mean, at, at the global level, all the different discussions that we have every meeting at different dialogues, we had so many different stakeholder group dialogues, independent dialogues and uh, member state dialogues. So at this uh, global level discussion, I, I was really um, amazed by all the different perspectives, different contributions that have been made by different uh, stakeholder groups. Um, but then, in order to really make all these discussions work, uh, materialize into the, uh, the um, implementation, um, I think there are, an, are a, uh, a number of things that I have learned, we have learned from this Food Systems Summit. And among them, I would like to highlight uh, very few points, uh, given the time limit that I have. Um, so uh, states usually lack the understanding and awareness of these different stakeholder groups that are being most affected in the food systems when we talk about food systems transformation. Um, and these people are who are usually left behind at the country and very local level. So these people need to be brought to the table for discussion and decision making, not only at the global level, but it needs to happen at the country level. So there are a few member state dialogues where we heard uh, feedback from uh, our counterparts, from our partner organizations and uh, the people that we work together with that uh, being not as inclusive as they need to be. So um, I think this really need to happen at uh, the ground level with the people who are really affected on the ground, who are really working from day to day on the, uh, in the food system. Um, so I was um, very much thrilled by the enthusiasm, awareness and commitment of my fellow youths from different parts of the world uh, throughout the process and beyond when it comes to food systems transformation. Um, and I would really like to bring this, um, the essence of uh, and the main ingredient the main value of the indigenous uh, food systems 
for being resilient, uh, that which we have seen also throughout uh, COVID-19 uh, period. So that is um, food systems transformation needs intergenerational transfer of knowledge and intergenerational cooperation for sustainability and resiliency. Uh, I think we have seen uh, this at the beginning of, uh, since the beginning of this food system summit process, me uh, being one of the youth vice chairs uh, on, on, in, in, in Action Track 4, um, which clearly needs to be strengthened and supported furthermore, not only at the global level, as I mentioned, it needs to go down to the country level and at, uh, to the very much local level to bring youth to uh, the de decision making table, to the dialogue table. And youths, there are a number of things that youths can contribute, as our former speakers have also highlighted a lot. Uh, so I really would like to highlight one point uh, what kind of um, um, uh, like main ingredient that we can bring into this food systems uh, transformation. Uh, it's mainly the technology and the innovative spirits that we have and the commitment that we have. Um, so there are a number of best practices that youths have shown in different parts of the world. And we are also seeing many other uh, increasing, uh, uh, how should I say, proving themselves to the world that uh, the uh, youths are bringing the solutions that we need to really bridge uh, between the uh, policy level uh, th that is going on and then the ground, uh, the things that are really happening on the ground. So as our event also mentions, uh, highlights, uh, food is future. So for us, food is the present also, and we are the present also. So, I mean, we uh, we can start already, we, we are already starting engaging not only youths, but younger children, kids, uh, to the discussion and, and for them to be really engaged in the food system, not only as consumers, but also uh, as stakeholders on the ground. So that needs to be upscaled. And as youths, we need not only uh, technical support, but always the financial support as uh, we being uh, one of the stakeholder groups with uh, very little and some very lowest income. So uh, I would really like to uh, highlight that we need a very big financial support for youths to be engaged and to uh, have a bigger say uh, into the food systems transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Um, for that beautiful message. I think before we go to Ms. Shakuntala, um, she's coming in online soon. Uh, I will get one more qu one question. Uh, this is to Mr. Shadhori. What is the role of parliamentarians in sustainable food system transformation at national level? Sir, uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, it's a very strategic role. I think first is understanding the needs. You know, what are the needs of the transformation? What has to change? And for that, of course, we have to listen to all the voices. This is part of the representation function that we have. And listening especially to the young people, listening carefully uh, to what they have to say, what they are thinking. And then um, if there are gaps in legislation, we have to look at that. If there is an existing legislation that can be improved, if you need a completely new legislation, we look at that. We look at policies, you know, how do we incentivize the transformation? How do we create uh, self-employment opportunities for young people? And last but not least is uh, through um, uh, appropriation or allocation uh, through the budgetary process. Uh, because unless you have the funding for it, unless you have the allocations in the budget, uh, you will not be able to bring the transformation uh, into life, into reality. So I think all of those important, uh, all of those are important. And these are, in fact, what our basic functions are as representatives of the people. So representation function, you know, our oversight function, making sure that the government is doing what they're supposed to be doing, our budgetary function, allocating resources, and finally, um, amending laws or incorporating new legislation. I think those would be the general areas. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Shadhari. I couldn't agree more with you because, you know, uh, here in the Philippines, it's really something that we're really uh, working towards, so not only on policy, but actually financial support to make all of these interventions happen and felt on the ground. Um, there are so many questions coming. Uh, well, uh, Ms. Shakantula is not here yet. Uh, I'll get one more question. This is for Marie Claire. Marie Claire, uh, please answer this question. You mentioned the youth declaration. Can you please tell us more about it? Is it published somewhere? Marie Claire, are you there? I think um, I will reserve that question for Marie Claire to come back. Uh, there's another question here for Mr. Uh, Tome Baze uh, Kamotima. How to better involve youth as key actor in national food system plans in relation to policy making and food environment intervention, for example? Yeah, um, sorry, Peter, my network had gone off, so I was trying to join again. Uh, sorry, you can raise the question again. The question is um, yes, uh, how to you... better involve how to better involve youth as the actor in national food system plans in relation to policy making and food environment interventions, for example. Yeah, th thank you so much. Um, I will speak from my experience. Uh, I have always believed that young people also have to show up if they are to be engaged uh, in uh, these processes. For example, we need to organize ourselves into networks, into associations, into cooperatives, and put our issues forward if we are to be heard. But also, we need the governments to be positive, to respond to our concerns and be able to engage us uh, in different planning processes. Uh, but what is more important is that as young people, we need to organize ourselves, we need to show up, we need to have our concerns clearly defined so that we can able to be supported by different actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomibaze. I'm so happy that we have now Ms. Uh, Shakuntala and uh, my question to you would be, if there was one ask for the summit, what would that be? If we would be one ask for the summit with a focus on youth, I do think my ask would be, let's try as much as possible as we go forward to bring in all the vice chairs again, the youth vice chairs, the several youth food systems champions and heroes and make sure that they are engaged in continuing for further and taking the UN food systems solution forward. We can do this not by having them just in the field as implementers, but giving them a seat at the table of decision makers. Thank you very much for that a question. Uh, well, Mary Claire is not back. I actually uh, want to ask my personal question to you because you know you are one of my role models in really pushing for you know a well nourished world. Uh, because of this pandemic, and it's so timely that we're actually discussing about food. And how do you see young people would create a lot of change in building a you know a in healthier um, generation coming moving forward and how do we really see our work having traction on the ground thank you hello is this to me nanook yes yes okay, good so action track four advanced equitable livelihoods is unique within the food systems because it's people-centered focusing on women, youth, and indigenous peoples throughout all of the food systems. And in the two years of the UN food systems with youth vice chairs in all five action tracks and several youth food systems champions and heroes, 
It has become apparent that we must work together with our generation of youth to transform our food systems towards 2030 and beyond. We have heard examples throughout all the discussions we have had, the dialogues that we have had at several levels, that there are examples that lay bare the biases against youth, more so for young women and indigenous youth in all through our present food systems. So we must give them the opportunity and they must grab the opportunity and not as individuals, but as groups to use their voices and bring forward their ideas and also their aspirations for the future in forming the solutions and implementing them. And for equity, accountability and sustainability of our solutions, for transforming food systems, for nourishing all peoples and our planet, youth, also young women, must be fully engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amish Kapantala, for answering that uh, beautiful question. And it's really about, you know, uh, having a collective voice to make collective action happen. And um, I think I was I was there during the Youth Pledge launch and declaration in Rome. So, and Sophie was also there. So I will ask a question to Sophie. Uh, as mentioned by Marie Claire, uh, there's a youth declaration. Can you tell us more about it? Is it published somewhere? Please take the floor, Sophie. Of course. Yes, of course. Uh, the Youth Declaration is a really, really exciting outcome of all youth consultation processes that have occurred since the beginning of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. So we've incorporated the voices of nearly 70,000 young people in this Youth Declaration through the Act for Change an Act for Food initiative, the UN Food Systems Summit youth consultation processes with the World Food Forum, um, and the youth independent dialogues or any dialogues that have occurred through the United Nations Food Systems Summit that have incorporated young people. We've collected all these youth priorities um, and demands young people have of governments and decision makers. We've put these all in one place called our Youth Declaration, and it will be published through the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign and on the United Nations um, through their processes as well. Um, so it's a really, really exciting document that um, is really highlighting global youth priorities, and it will be with you very shortly. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Before we end, I would like to call Mr. Shadhari for a quick point. Thank you so much, uh, Shari. Just one quick point, because you were asking about the summit and the expectations from the summit. I think it's very important that the summit uh, isn't one of, of, uh, of nice rhetoric and noble sentiments. Uh, we want a summit of action, a summit that actually delivers. And I hope there can be some sort of a discussion after the summit and we monitor, you know, to what extent the pledges that the heads of governments are making are in fact implemented. I think that monitoring, that holding to account is very important. And I hope the youth uh, who are present today will have an active role in that regard. And certainly as parliamentarians, we will also do our part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shadhari. Thank you, Ms. Shakuntala Thilstead, uh, Mighty, and to all our speakers. It's such a wonderful afternoon from my side of the world. I'm in the Philippines, and good morning to the other side of the world. Good evening to other, um, you know, people listening to us. Uh, this is such a wonderful uh, discussion that we have, and hopefully we can move forward where youth is not only taking in of the future, but also taking responsibility of the present as we move forward. Thank you again, and uh, good luck.
Thank you so much, Sherry. That was simply fantastic. Well done, well done, well done. After having heard all the speakers talk about their key takeaways from the summit process and what they find important for food systems, we want to hear from you again. So we ask you to please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and enter the code on your screen into your phone or browser, and it's easy to follow along from there. The question we'd like to hear from you is, what future food issue is most important to you? Again, I'll repeat that. What, which future food issue is most important to you? Please go ahead and start filling that in. And I'm going to ask Sophie, can we ask you, well, how would you reply to this question? It's such a good question. And after hearing from all the incredible speakers, what, what kind of stuck out to me was from Mary Claire, a fellow youth activist, and she said, our youth vision is simple. We want a food system that nourishes people and planet. And on the back of that, I would think that everyone should be able to afford a healthy and nutritious diet. And I believe that governments should not only make sure people have access to food, but access to good quality, nutritious food that is also affordable. Because right now, a lot of nutritious, healthy foods are, are luxury. And this shouldn't be the case when we move forward into the future. Um, so yes, that, that's what I think um, is the most important food, future food issue, um, especially for young people. Awesome, I completely agree with you. It's actually amazing that we're having the food summit right next to the climate summit. Um, so those issues are so intertwined and we cannot work in silos when we think about the food and the climate issues. I love that you brought in the availability and affordability of food. I'll also add in accessibility because many times affordable food is not even accessible to our low income communities or in many of our urban slums. Um, so it's quite amazing that we're starting to have these discussions and I just love the youth voices that we've heard uh, today. Um, they're just so refreshing and so exciting. Sophie, can you read out some of what is coming in um, on our uh, box? Because it's a bit small for me, uh, but maybe it's because I'm no longer in the youth category. So if you could just read them out um, so that everybody can get excited about what we're seeing on the uh, coming in from all over the world. Of course, no problem. Um, what we're seeing is that we have a 27% of our viewers and participants believe that sustainable food production and biodiversity is the most important future food issue. Um, following that, 23%, oh, just went up to 25% of people believe sustainability and climate change is the most important future food issue. 19% is drawn between um, health, nutrition and diet and food security and access. And then at the 3% we have food waste, animal welfare and antibiotics, farming and agriculture and human rights. Very interesting. That's awesome. And human rights is so critical. Um, the farmers' rights, the food workers' rights, that's really critical. And if we don't address many of these issues, it's almost snowballs. It's actually almost counterproductive. Um, so the rights of workers in the food ecosystem is so critical as well. Um, and oftentimes we neglect that. So thank you guys for sharing that. Very insightful. Very, very insightful. And also add gender. Gender equity is huge, right? And uh, women play such an important part in the food ecosystem. And today we have uh, two female moderators, but we can't take it for granted that in many platforms, women are still excluded. Um, and so that's critical. Fantastic. Thank you so much for responding to all the polls. Uh, we're going to have another poll um, and we'd love to see all the live reactions. But first, we'll watch a video. Sophie, can you introduce our video? With pleasure. So in this video, we will hear from young people from right across the globe about what good food means to them. Good food to me is a basic human right. Good food is a food that respects indigenous communities, marginalized communities, peasants, and women. Good food means to me a healthy and a wholesome diet which fuels the energy of the youth. 
so that they are healthy both physically and mentally. They are sustainably produced and responsibly consumed in a manner that ensures the most minimal wastage possible. That will fuel my body, give me the right nutrients and boost my immunity to help me fight diseases. Remember, we're in a pandemic, right? And what good food means to me is more than what ends up on the plate. It's thinking about the processes from the land, farm, grocery store, to the consumer at the end. It is also happiness. Happiness for everyone involved in its production, from the one who grows it to the one who eats it, and the numerous people involved in between. It means food that comes from a place where the harvesters are being treated ethically. Connecting to the soil, connecting to the roots. Good food to me is an innovative recipe that represents my culture, where my traditions and global ethic blend in harmony. To me, good food means my family. Good food should be fun. It should bring people together, not tear people apart. To ensure good food for all, we need to act with urgency and we need to act with other people in mind. Fantastic video, and it's just wonderful to hear all the voices coming in from all over the world. Throughout the UN FSS process, over 2,000 ideas have been sourced from around the world through a public consultation process in the different action tracks. In this next section, we'll hear from some of the game changer ideas. I'm excited to hear the conversation between five youth representatives who speak with those who have worked actively on these important game changers. We'll kick off with a conversation between Liz Good Goodwin and Dipti Chowdhury. Liz is a senior fellow and director, food loss and waste at World Resource Institute. She also serves as chair of the London Waste and Recycling Board. Dipti Chowdhury, who I've heard speak many times on Action Track One, is active in the SKNF network in Bangladesh and also a youth champion for Act for Ch Change, Act for Food. They'll discuss the game changer on food is never waste. Over to you, Dipti. Thank you so much, NJD. Um, and thank you so much, everyone who are with us here in this time. So globally, one third of food is lost and wasted between farm and four each year. It results in dollar, 940 billion per year of economic losses across the supply chain. Undoubtedly, it is a great problem and needs to be addressed. I'm very happy that today, now our topic is food is never waste. And here we have Liz Goodwin, who is working with this subject. I'd like to listen first from you that how much it will contribute to reform our food system. Like, why do you think it is a game changer? Over to you, Lich. So, um, so thank, you, thank you very much for the question. That's it's. Um, I think the food, food, tackling food waste is fundamental. It, it addresses all sorts of SDGs. It was really interesting to hear the poll just now that Sophie was talking about, because lots of concerns about nutrition, access to food, gender equality, farmer livelihoods. You know, it tackles all these issues, um, and it's quite clear as well that we will never achieve. The Paris Climate Agreement targets if we don't tackle food loss and waste. It's a massive issue. As you say, we waste around a third of all the food that's produced. At the same time, one in 10 people go to bed hungry every day. It costs nearly a trillion dollars. It contributes 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. The amount of food loss and waste is um, is a waste of a quarter of the water used in agriculture. You know, lots of places have water shortages and then we're throwing away essentially a quarter of all that's used in agriculture. And the food loss and waste is, it required land mass the size of China to grow it. And we've wasted it. Uh, it's just it's just a scandal that, that as a civilised society, we should not be allowed to continue. So, but I think the, the game changer that we have 
is really fundamental because it brings together all parts of the supply chain, all parts of the food system, and it's based on collaboration. And I think it's the collaboration, increased transparency, increased communication, making decisions about the food system that affect the food system, not making a decision in a retailer about what is interesting to that retailer, but thinking about the entire food system and thinking about the implications of that decision on the farmer and on the manufacturer. So really thinking holistically and having that much greater collaboration. That's why I think what we've got is a, is a game changer. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, we know to transform food system, we have many plans, we have many laws, but sometimes when we go to uh, implement this, we, have, we, we face many challenges. So what challenges do you uh, think that we will face to implement this? There are, as you say, there are loads of loads of challenges. Um, you look at all the different parts of the supply chain. I mean, one of them is is how long our supply chains are, and the difficulties of communicating and having transparency up and down the supply chain. And that can be worked on in lots of ways by people talking to each other and working together. But I'm sure there are going to be some technical solutions that help us. You know, we've got much better connectivity through the internet. Um, you know, th things coming along like blockchain, they're going to help improve the transparency on the, along the supply chain. So I think that will help. Um, but also we've got to think about um, some, of the, the, some of the other issues. For example, a lot of the issues that, that occur in um, some of the lower income countries are to do with um, infrastructure, and um, lack of uh, lack of roads and lack of cold storage. So we need to sort out some of those basic fundamentals of um, finance and investment in in the in the system. Some of that's down to government funding. Some of it's down to um, finance and access to finance for farmers um, and improving that access to finance. So there are there are specific issues that need to be addressed. You come right to the other end of the supply chain to us as householders we waste a ridiculous amount of food. And this is not just a high income country problem, it's also a middle income country problem just as much. There was a, a report that came out from UNEP earlier this year, the food waste index, that showed that household food waste is a problem across the world. And that requires all of us as individuals to try to, to value food more and to try not to waste food, to, to plan, to only, you know, to buy what we need and then use what we buy. That's a sort of mantra that I, I use a lot because it's very easy to say in one sentence, you know, buy what you need and use what you buy. And that really sums it up. And But one of the you know great things from that is that actually tackling food loss and waste is something that every single person can do something about. This isn't just a problem that can be sorted out by governments or by that big retailer. It's something that all of us have a role to play. Thank you so much, Liz. And uh, what do you think? What do we need to uh, have the hundred percent implementation of this plan that food is never whipped? Well, I think we need to see far more awareness, um, and this is why events like this are, are so good because the more people know that actually food waste is important. You know, ten percent of greenhouse gas emissions—that's far more than um, aviation. And everyone worries about the amount of aviation that goes on. Well, we should be worrying about food waste. And as I say, you know, one in 10 people don't have enough food. So this is this is a mismatch that we have to sort out. Um, but I think so. I think awareness is really important. And then working together and really focusing on a joint objective. You know, the objective is food should never be waste. You know, that's why we've called it food is never waste. Food is food it shouldn't be treated like a throwaway item when some people don't have enough. So we have to make sure that the food system is as circular as possible and that any potential for food loss and waste around, as it's going around the system, it's scooped up again. So where you do get um, food falling out of, the, out of the, the cycle, it can be used for animal feed or it can be used in other beneficial ways. Um, so let's 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 treat it like a precious resource that it is. 
thank you so much. So it's maybe my last question. It's about the youth. Youth as the biggest force. Uh, so we we should uh, make them engaged in every new step, in every new plan. So we 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 can't uh, do anything for the future world leaving behind the youth. So what's the engagement of youth in your plan and 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 in this law and uh, topic? I mean, you, you are that you are the leaders of the future, and we have, you know, we need to uh, make sure that you are able to to be the leaders that are going to live with a sustainable food system. We can't just hand over the problem to you, um, but we have to work together um, to to come up with some of those solutions that are going to be fit for the future. Because you know how the world, you know, you have a better idea of how the world's going to be than um, than, than me, um, and. So I think it, it is about working together and we need to find better ways of, of ensuring that happens. You know, going right back to, let's make sure that children in schools understand the value of food. They understand where their food comes from. They know how to use it. They know how to store it. Um, and they have a sense of value for the food. And then that feeds all the way through the system. Um, but also, Lots of young people have, are, are setting up their own businesses. They're entrepreneurs. They're innovative. Um, you know, let's harness that. Let's get some of those innovations, some of those technical solutions and other solutions that are going to uh, really transform the food system. Um, and because I think the, the future can be really bright. If we could sort out some of these issues, it, it must be possible to make the food system more sustainable and to reduce food loss and waste. You know, I, I come back to the the comment, it's a third of what we've produced. It's crazy um, when we have so much hunger and uh, lack of food security around the world. Thank you, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful. And Sophie is here with me, our wonderful youth leader. And we are very happy that we are in your plan. And we believe that it will be, this trade problem will be solved very soon. Sophie. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. This dialogue has been incredibly important and I think I've learned so much just listening to an intergenerational dialogue that you have just showcased. Food waste, food should never be waste and we will never achieve the Paris Climate Change Agreements if we don't tackle it. As Liz, you mentioned, 10% of greenhouse gas emissions is caused by food waste. And this should be a global priority as we move closer to COP26 and COI16, which is the youth COP. And what's really special about the solutions to tackling food waste is that it is accessible. And I love that we've left this dialogue with the message from Liz, buy what you need and use what you buy. How simple, how accessible is that? And next, I would like to invite Luke Spijak from Action Track 2 as a youth representative, a researcher, um, and World Food Programme consultant, and also Juan Lucas Restrepo, Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International Centre for Tropical agriculture. They will discuss what actions we need to take to ensure nature positive production. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thanks everybody involved for giving this platform to youth and also to Juan Lucas for joining uh, to answer some questions. So I will start with a quite basic question. So your action track focuses around nature positive production and many people might have heard about sustainable agriculture but might not have heard of nature positive agriculture. So what is nature positive agriculture or nature positive production and why is it a game changer? Yeah, thank you, uh, Luke, and it's, uh, it's great uh, to be here. We, we are talking about nature positive because we need to understand that food production is uh, the main, a uh, very important driver of environmental uh, degradation. And it's not only linked on uh, how uh, production uh, is, is happens, but how it links to climate change, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, 
and how the food system is broken given even though we supposedly produce enough food there is still 811 million people going hungry so basically nature positive and the word solution means that we don't we don't want to just uh, do no harm uh, to fix the system but we can really use a new paradigm to unleash the power of food systems to support a thriving biodiversity healthy ecosystem services and uh, provide healthy and, and nutrition foods, uh, produce clean water, sequester carbon, and provide opportunities to, to improve uh, livelihoods. To get this done, it's not only to have the technology, the science behind to do this from farmers, as well as from scientists uh, working uh, together, but it's also about repurposing the incentives framework, uh, how uh, we give public support uh, to farmers, uh, for example. And I was in the meeting of G20 uh, last weekend, and hearing from ag ministers of Australia and the UK saying we are transitioning to paying farmers for biodiversity conservation, for soil health, etc. Uh, this big dialogue is already uh, making people change the way they see food systems and they support these nature positive uh, solutions uh, that we've been building uh, from Action Track uh, 3 and our, our action area throughout this uh, fantastic process. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear about the thinking behind this aspiration towards being positive for nature rather than just less bad in terms of agriculture, which is inspiring. So my next question, it relates to your own past experience. So you currently work for uh, a research institution at the moment, and previously you were vice minister of the Colombian Ministry of Agriculture and also worked with the Colombian Federation of Coffee Growers. So from your experience across these different sectors, what needs to happen to really make this move to nature positive production seen in the real world at scale? Well, what, what we are have seen and from my past and present experience is a huge inertia. The, the, piece of, the pace of change is clearly not enough and the ways uh, ministries, the private sector behavior, et cetera, changes is, is incremental. It gets better over time, but it's very slow. So, so this is why we really need to change the paradigm and why our action track, uh, you know, with crowdsourced ideas, game-changing solutions from across, you know, hundreds of, of proposals came with a set of solutions for nature positive production that could really provide a new framework of how ministers of agriculture, environment, et cetera, look at, uh, at production. So we're talking about agroecology, regenerative agriculture, agrobiodiversity as a, as a huge and important tool, sustainable livestock that needs to be part of this conversation. Without it in the conversation, change will not be uh, significant enough. Aquatic and blue foods, as we've been ignoring that you know, powerful source of uh, environmental enhancement and also a uh, food uh, pro uh, provision, uh, among a few others. And, and all, this, all of this is backed by a uh, real life uh, experience. So you know, looking at 700,000 he hectares uh, under agroecology in Andhra Pradesh in India, for example, tells that things can be done in a different way and government, civil society, private sector have tools to move forward into a more nature positive production way of doing things. Great. And I think we're probably coming up to time, but I'll ask one question with the remaining time is when we talk about sustainable or nature positive production, there can sometimes be a bit of disagreement about what that involves and the role of different uh, technologies, for example. So I was wondering how you navigated this working on your action track when some people for example might recommend things such as regenerative agriculture and then other people might recommend things such as genetic modification so how do you how did you navigate these different perspectives on what nature positive production looks like well my, in, in the way I've, I've seen this through the process if we become dogmatic if we say there's only one way to make the world uh, better and it's this formula 
we are going to fail uh, miserably. So, so we really need to accommodate and give room to test uh, and, and work on different solutions so we can have a huge agroecology movement uh, and a coalition that has 21 countries and 31 organizations behind, behind side by side with uh, ag innovation efforts focused on climate adaptation and mitigation such as the one uh, the US and others are are promoting. Those two can coexist and at some time we will see which uh, takes a, a larger share of the landscapes uh, basically. But we need to give room for all types of solutions uh, to really fix our food system. Great, yeah, I definitely agree. And particularly when we were hearing before about the need for context specificity and the fact that there's no one size fits all solution. So it's really clear that for dialogues such as this to have relevance, we really need to be inclusive to a different range of approaches and also bring lots of stakeholders on board. Um, if we have any remaining time, I'd just like to ask how young people can play a role in overcoming some of the inertia and accelerating the change we need to see. Well, uh, as we've heard through the day, youth, youth is critical. And, and the, the first thing is uh, make youth and provide the, the information, the knowledge to make them more conscious consumers, understanding what they put in their plate can influence their own lives uh, as they, the, the more nutrition and, and healthy diets uh, is, is, is fantastic for them. But what that means for farmers, for livelihoods, for the landscapes, uh, what uh, does it mean about uh, equity, uh, etc. The more uh, youth pushes forward uh, a better plate of food, uh, the transformation will speed up uh, significantly. And then we also need to unlock uh, bringing youth back uh, to farming and make it attractive through digital, through technology, to uh, 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 so, uh, resolving land tenure access and, uh, and access to, to, to other rights. So we need to work two ways, from the consumer standpoint and opening room again to make uh, farming attra attractive for youth, which is currently not necessarily the case in many landscapes uh, across geographies. Great, thank you. Well, I think we're out of time, but thanks a lot for engaging in this dialogue. Thanks. That was such a wonderful session. Thank you so much for all the great work you are doing in the landscape. I mean, when I reflect on the speakers we've had this morning, my heart is just filled with so much joy. To have champions and change agents at the forefront of these game changers, but also ensuring that it's not just talk, but action just warms my heart and gives me so much hope about the future. So well done to all of you and congratulations. Keep up the great work. Next up, we have Fiola. Faludia from Indonesia, who is a freshman from the Faculty of Industrial Technology at the Bandung Institute of Technology. She's also an active member of UNICEF's Youth Network in Indonesia. She'll talk to Franz Siet, who is a Youth and Livelihoods Technical Advisor at Care International, and together they'll discuss the topic of youth employment. Over to you, Fayola. Okay, thank you so much, Ndidi. Hello, everyone. So we are aware that the youth population is currently the largest youth generation has ever been, accounting for 16% of the world's population. And also food systems are the largest employer of youth globally. So Franz here, I want to ask you, what, why do you think youth involvement here is a game changer? Over to you, Franz. Thank you for having me. It's great talking to you, Farula, about uh the important role you've had to play to ensure that we have a uh, uh, sustainable and, and uh, more inclusive uh, agri-food system. It's quite important when you're looking at, at uh, the state of youth in uh, mostly uh, developing countries. Uh, when you're looking at youth employment, which average uh, more than 20% of youth, mostly in rural areas and, and also to uh, out of three, you have two women, usually, most of the time, that will be a part of, of, of that statistic that are not uh, uh, profiting from the dividends of, of the agri-food system. And it's very important that if you're talking about inclusive uh, uh, agri-food system, to engage as much as possible the next generation that will be not only be consumers on the consumer side, but also 
on the uh, economic participation side, where you have to provide uh, enough uh, uh, support to make sure that you can not only uh, participate, but also have access to resources, financing, uh, technology, and the skill set that are necessary for the next generation of, of, of uh, uh, operators in the agri-food system. In that sense, it's very important that we look at that, that aspect of the agri-food system, because if we keep looking at youth just as a, a, a mouth to feed or just as a consumer, uh, it leaves uh, uh, on the side all the opportunities that you can leverage to make sure that they can contribute, they can participate, and they can bring innovative way of improving uh, specific value chains, but also the world rural economies that has to provide for them and their families and their communities in, in, a, in a broader sense. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I really want to ask you here, uh, what is need uh, or what is needed or being planned to move forward with this game changer? What are the significant changes or steps that youth can do uh, right now? If you look at the game changer, it's really about building uh, partnerships uh, to accelerate uh, action in, in, in that uh, space. And youth has a very important role to play. Not only does the institutional policy level, a lot of advocacy to bring youth forward and give them voice in, in those space, but also at the youth level, I think there's a real opportunity for them to engage, to build the skills and, and I, I would say, uh, bring themselves into that space uh, to be more proactive in terms of uh, understanding, getting the knowledge and understanding the, the potential of that, uh, of the agri-food system and really put themselves in a position where they can really uh, integrate uh, uh, the value chains, participate in, in, in market and getting the skills to integrate different uh, uh, level of the value chain that has potential for work, potential for uh, uh, entrepreneurship, potential for innovative uh, uh, ways of doing business in that in that sector, and you see a growing number of youth embracing uh, the agri-food system. But there's still a lot to be done to make sure that they have not only the skill set but the means. By means, I mean uh, access to resources. When you think about land, when you think about um, access to, to, to inputs, uh, when you think about all the necessary tools that you need to really be uh, productive and efficient in that, in that uh, sector, it's very important that you, uh, uh, to that, uh, to that um, end, really look into ways to integrate um, the, 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 the possibilities that the agri-food system offer. Uh, at the local level and regional and, and, and global. Okay, wonderful. I think I have one more question for you. So we know that to increase youth involvement in agricultural sector, there are so many things to be done, right? Uh, what do you think is the first step, the most compulsory, the most critical step that every youth should take in order to maximize youth involvement in this sector? I, I think um, most of the time we think that that uh, youth of uh, that generation are not necessarily interested in, agri in, in agriculture or the agri-food system because it's hard work. It's, it's, I think, first of all, you need, they need to understand that uh, when we say the food is the future and youth is the future, you have uh, a generation that has a responsibility to carry forward uh, in terms of, of uh, producing enough food for them but for themselves, nutritious uh, food, they have to uh, really look at uh, what's at stake uh, uh, regarding the agri-food system. Once you often understand what's at stake for them in the agri-food system, I think they understand that there's a lot of uh, potential for them to, to build the skills and, 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 and knowledge that are necessary to, to be uh, active participating in that space but also to understand the challenge for, for, for their own country, their own uh, communities uh, with respect to food production. Uh, with, uh, earlier, we talked about food waste and loss. 
Uh, we talked about uh, inclusive value chains. There's a lot of uh, pieces that needs to be to be uh, well understood. There's a lot of knowledge uh, and capacity building that needs to go around to make sure that you uh, understand the, the what's at stake uh, in, in the agri-food system and build the skills to really become uh, uh, the, the next generation of farmers, of, of market operators, of entrepreneur that will uh, uh, integrate uh, the, the markets and, and contribute to Im the improvement of, of, of the agro-food system in the broader sense. Uh, it does a lot to be done, as you said, you can really pick one and, and, and think that it's gonna, it's gonna uh, I'll say, uh, the, the, uh, solve the problem, but uh, to, to, to really think uh, strategically, there's, a, there's that uh, four type of, of, of intervention at the knowledge, policy, and, and uh, advocacy as well, but also building the skill sets uh, and, and providing uh, the financing that are really crucial for, for youth to be uh, active participating in, in the agri-food system. Okay, thank you so much. That was very insightful. So uh, if I can conclude here, we can see that youth participation is very crucial in order to um, maximize the agricultural and also food systems, not only in your country, but also in the world. Uh, as for example, I am right now is one of the UNICEF Youth Network uh, member in Indonesia. So one of the biggest steps that you can take is to participate in your local community so you can learn more. Like me, I learned a lot from you, friends. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tara. Okay. Okay, I give it to you back, Sophie. Thank you so much, Paola. This was a fascinating dialogue, as all intergenerational dialogues are. We need to have more of them. And to hear how open and transparent um, this game-changing solution is between youth and youth commitment is of utmost importance um, as we lead up into the United Nations Food System Summit tomorrow, um, COI 16, COP 26, Nutrition for Growth, and when we lead up into the end of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030. Um, so I thank you both for being here and committing your time and energy and passion to this really, really important game-changing solution. And we will now move on to hear from Ismahan Elouf, Chief Scientist at the Food and Agriculture Organization. She will talk with Terry Atiano, a, a social activist passionate about humanitarian causes and the Kenyan Red Cross Youth Board Secretary in Nairobi. Wow, incredible. These titles are always amazing. They will discuss Food Systems Stability Board. Over to you, Terry. Hello, I'm glad to be here and um, very passionate about the fact that we're talking uh, about food. We often uh, think food is a, a normal part of our lives and therefore do not give it much attention. And because of this, it results to a lot of unpaid labor. And uh, Action Track 4 is uh, focusing on equitable livelihoods where we want the food system to give us more value, to be able to sustain us, so to give us work. And that means an end of the unpaid labor that occurs in the food system and at the same time we want the food to be distributed equally um, across the globe so that there is zero hunger and um, so today i'm going to interview ishmane and i'm uh, very very happy about it and um, we understand that one of the game-changing solutions that have been proposed is the creation of the food systems stability board um, kindly and help us understand what this board is and why it is a game changer. Thank you very much, Terry, and really, I'm delighted to be with you today here. And uh, what this game changer idea is suggesting, Terry, as you said, it's really to put in place a food system stability board. And the idea is that to launch a light touch year long multi-stakeholder process to explore if 
we could have a global mechanism to really monitor and coordinate the risk at the global food system level. Uh, the idea is very interesting, but also there is a lot of things already going on. And that's where I want to really uh, pitch that we need always to assess what we have. Uh, right now, we have a number of organisms or organizations, as well as initiatives, that are doing much of that work. So if I want to just give you an example, FAO, which is, I'm the chief scientist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, has really its main mandate is to exchange information on markets, on science, on technologies. It does have a number of initiatives on risk. Of course, the major component of the work, it's policy advice in terms of food system, including all components of the food system. So there are a number of initiatives and organizations that exist that already are taking part of what is suggested. And that's where, when we think about a game changer, we have always to think about add value. So we have to assess what we have. We have to see where we have the gaps and then try to fit that gap with add value, with ideas, with new ways of doing it. So I want to here bring in the importance of CFS, which is the Committee on Food Security, which is really one of the most inclusive global plat platform on food security and nutrition. And this CFS really bring in not only member states, but also civil society, but also private sector and other actors. So over to you, Tony. Okay, um, what I get from your explanation is that um, this board is going to be um, uh, focusing a lot on uh, policy and uh, um, actions or rather solutions that are going to be gotten from institutions. And this is now making me uh, ask that uh, in these policy making processes and interactions between institutions, what is the role of uh, the youths? What role are the youth going to play? To play in actualizing the this board. So uh, the youth, the youth, and that was said by many of the speakers before, is future. So the title of all this, it's food is future. In my mind, absolutely, food it's now and and always. But really, the future is the youth. So the youth going to be the policy makers of tomorrow. The youth going to be the main actors of tomorrow the youth gonna be the educator of tomorrow. So it's very important to have space for youth at the national level first. So the youth has to be well represented in the national level, in the policy making frames within the national level. With the board that is suggested by the colleagues from WRI, it's, it's really the youth could an added value because the voices of youth are not yet well heard when we talk about resilience. The voice of youth is not well, well expressed and well integrated when we talk about really resilience of food system. And here maybe what I wanna myself bring in, when we say youth has to be part of the national program and the global discussion, it's really the youth to come back to agriculture and to food systems. We are seeing many of the youth running away from the agriculture and the food system because most of the youth look at agriculture as a less interesting or less sexy sector and they don't see in it enough innovation, enough technologies, enough challenges. And that's why I'm calling myself from my perspective as a chief scientist, to really we need the food systems to adopt more innovation, to adopt more technology, to revive the system. Because not only because we have mega challenges that many of my colleagues talked about, be it climate change that is hitting very hard and we're talking about very, very harsh scenarios. Even the 1.5, it's very hard, but now we're talking most probably about two degrees or four degrees. Not only because we have a huge number of poverty, but also huge malnutrition. And the malnutrition that we were used to, which is, and the nourishment, we have now a lot of also obesity problems. 
So because of that, we need to transform the food system. But because also we need to bring in youth, because if we don't bring in youth, we're going to have a huge problem in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, much more than now. And the only way to transform the food system and to produce more with less input is to bring in science and technology and innovation and bring in youth. And I hope really youth could give us that push to innovate our food system, to use more technology, to use less input and produce more calories, but also more nutrients. So youth are needed at all levels and we need them at a, at a scale that will make a difference. So we are not talking about few initiatives here and there. We need to really uh, a scale that give us really a critical mass. So we do have the change and the transformation we need. Oh, great, great. So from my understanding, I gather that the food system is now going to need much more than being on the farm. And so for us as youth, it's kind of more encouraging to know that we can now also work in the food system without necessarily working on um, the farm so that it's more sexy to us. But then I am wondering, in order for this board to exist what kind of support does it need from other institutions because of course there's no way um the board can just spring up from you know from such uh, action-oriented discussions and then start operating independently what kind of support does this board need in order to exist to be created exist and are now function uh, so, so as I said earlier, Terry, it's, it's an interesting idea that needs to be fine-tuned, that needs to be discussed, that should take in consideration the existing organization and the existing mechanisms and the existing initiatives. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, uh, resilience is very important as a concept. And I think really we, we had the action track five really digging in details what resilience means. I was luckily part of the scientific committee and we wrote a paper on, on the resilience of the food system. Uh, and, and really the idea is that within the resilience, you have to gather data. And that's really what the board is calling for. It's to really have a very good understanding of what's happening almost uh, in real time so that we don't get into huge problems. We don't get into huge crisis and then we have to rebuild again. So the, the board is calling for a coalition at the government level, at the institution level, so that we have that data and those data guide our, uh, our plans and guide, guide our interventions. So uh, the other things, the data is very important uh, the, the exchange of information is very important. The early warning system, when we talk about either climate change uh, crisis or maybe market disruption, there are many things that we could use early warning system, be it on the climatic change or economic side or social side and, and so on and so forth. So all these information are extremely important. Uh, the the idea that I want to also maybe pass through this interview is that uh, beyond, uh, beyond really having the data and understanding it, what we need also to push for, it's a diversification at all levels in terms of uh, the food system. So it is resilient and it is uh, more strong to the different shocks that might come across. Well, thank you very much as interviewing you and uh, as my final remark i would like to say that it is through action oriented discussions that we will have the future we want which is food thank you thank you very much terry thank you Sophie, we can't hear you. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> this always happens online. But I was just saying I'd really like to thank you for that really, really great dialogue and understanding why uh, this game-changing solution is so important, not only to the future of young people, but to the future of um, planetary health. Um, now, we would last but not least like to learn more from the youth in African Agriculture Consortium. Empowering farmers and especially youth is essential for the availability and affordability of nutritious foods. And I would like to invite Ploy Thirapong Hyobon. I'm very sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, please do correct me, um, who works at Scholars of Sustenance, a food rescue nonprofit that uses good quality surplus ingredients from food business to distribute and cook for low income communities in need. She will talk to Rahmat Ifunjoo, the co-CEO from Nourishing Africa, to discuss this idea further. Over to you, Ploy. Thank you so much, Sophie. And thank you everyone so much for having me today. And hello, Ramat. Nice to meet you and nice to see you here. So I am Ploy from Bangkok, Thailand, and I'm the EU representative here. Um, yeah, and as we all know that in this world, our food system is not really sustainable. We have used a lot of resources to produce so much food each year. And we still know that part of that produced food also being thrown away at the end of the day. And we also learned that by the end of 2020, we still need to feed a lot more people because the population will raising so far by that year, right? And that is the time that me and also a lot of my friend and everyone in the world started thinking about how we can produce food to be enough to feed more people in that at that uh, in that decade and that year. So I have learned so much about Rama works about nourishing Africa and then I was so inspiring and and fascinated by her work and today I would like to know more about a coalition, a coalition for youth in African agriculture solution that Rama has proposed to the UN Food System Summit. So Rama, can I please ask about why do you think this, the, this solution is a game changer for the food system? Thank you so much, Ploy. Hi, everyone. It's really a delightful pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, going straight to the to your question, Ploy. So what I would first like to say is that it is always exciting for me to hear about youth, food, and future in the same sentences. And Ismail, I had Ismail speak about you know a lot about how youth need to be represented in discussions around like culture and food, how they are innovating in the food systems. And I will say that youth is the future of food. I believe that there should be no doubt about that at this point, really, because youth are at the forefront of innovation. They are our climate change actors. They are really leveraging technology and innovation to transform the food systems. We can go on and on and on. But then when we come to youth representation, identification of youth activities, engagement of youth in the agriculture and food sector, one thing that has become quite clear and why we need this game changing idea to be you know, out there, launched as soon as possible, is that we have realized that for every initiative, for every intervention, for every youth activity out there, they are really micro, they are mostly operating in the informal sector, and there's a lot of fragmentation in the space. And really, to push all of these interventions out there to be able to achieve impact at scale and to be able to break the silos and remove the fragmentation in the landscape, it is really important to coordinate youth action. Because, for example, I know that for many conferences, for many of these kind of summits, we're seeing that the same set of youths year in, year out are invited to speak at those kinds of events because of what they're doing, which is all great. But I would like to say that there are so many other youth actors out there operating in different niches across various localities and rural areas that also need to step out 
and become even more recognized. And that is why we are proposing this African Youth Coalition in Agriculture where through the power of the networks and association and youth bodies, we are able to amalgamate and coordinate the various youth interventions and actions in the landscape to be able to you know, bring everybody together and for stakeholders to be also able to identify and work with these various youth actors. I'll leave it there for now. I know you have more questions for me, Gloria. Yes, that is it's so interesting to hear about that because I also experienced myself when I start to do something about new project, it, maybe it can be social innovation or environmental um, solving problem. It's more like we are the youth group that we work alone and and we work, work separately and not not never linked together to make it bigger and and make a move in in the in the high level. So I would like to ask more about like, um, because different young people in, in, in the region might have different interests. How do you select them to work together and make sure that they will not have conflict of interest to work together for a long term and have sustainable solution? Thank you so much, Floyd. I would like to say that first, I think at this, at this point, it is really important to push the agenda for co-creation, shared geniuses, shared successes. And I would really like to say now is not even the time to think about competition. There is so much transformation to be had in the agriculture sector. I mean, there are so many problems we all want to tackle, and there are so many opportunities to tackle this from various local, regional, and other perspectives. So I would like to say that first, there are even, we do not have enough of such initiatives. As many as there are, actually, there is quite a lot to be done to transform the agriculture and food system. Africa alone will double in size by 2030. That is a lot of mouths to be fed. And we need all hands on deck. We need all youth to come on board to solve the food and nutritional challenges. Climate change is out there and there is so much everybody can do. So I would like to say that co-creation, co-playing co in the space is really the agenda to be pushed forward right now and everybody can actually be a winner in this coalition because there will be, we anticipate a level playing ground where youth from the rural, from the professional, we use in the professional sector, agri-food SMEs can actually come together to leverage the power of networks uh, to advance their various agenda with various stakeholders. Thank you so much. So what I understanding is more like your solution we're trying to empower all the young people who is in the food sector to come together and think really co-create the solution and not thinking about the competition because we will all have to need uh, need to have the same mission to make it um, possible for the future. So for the next one, because you are saying that because the youth, if they work alone, they might be struggle with finding the funding or access to all those resources that might be essential for their development or the the project that they are doing. So. Um, how do you feel like um, how to attract the investor or the private sector or government to really jump in and empower the youth who are working on transforming food system as well? Thank you so much for that question. I've seen from working with SMEs, especially in the landscape, is that there isn't the problem isn't a lack of funding, uh, really, because there are so many stakeholder initiatives out there. There, are, there is a lot of interest in youth groups at the moment. So while we have seen one aspect being a lot of lack of investment readiness on the part of the youth, we have also seen on the part of the funders the inability to actually find this youth to engage, to be able to you know, coordinate with them, to understand what sort of funding is needed, and to understand you know, where they are and the mechanism with which they can deploy many of this um, funding and support system to them. So one thing I would like to say is that with the coalition, it is absolutely possible to be able to find and engage youth on several levels. 
there are so many initiatives out there. We have the um, FAO's one million initiative that I get to engage one million youth. That are, and I can list a lot of all others. So we already have these initiatives looking to advance an ecosystem of support, including funding to youth already. But the question is, where will you find them? How will you understand their pain points? How would you understand what they're working on? And that's what this coalition aims to solve through amalgamation, coming together and continuously identifying various use actions, various use interventions. That's when we'll be able to you know, leverage all of the support systems that are already out there, I must say. Thank you. That, that's so uh, wonderful because I feel like this is the hardest one that young people all over the world who are trying to change this world are facing at the moment because they are lacking of the opportunity to really leash um, those kind of very big level private and government sector to help them. And the last question, because I'm actually the one who is doing social impact um, project and sometimes I'm facing with the, how to say like, we want we all want someone to really empower and support us all the time. Will that solution really help to support young people to continue doing what they believe as well? Roy, can you please repeat the question for me? Pardon? Yes. Yes, I was asking if you could take the question again. Unless you oh, yes. Repeat. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of young people, when they start doing something to change the world or even changing something, and sometimes when they work for, um, for a bit, and then they start thinking about, do they work it on the right track? And they, they might start thinking about, Maybe they may need some support from the expert and some support from the mentor as well. How do you think that you can support them in that way? All right, so when it comes to supporting youths along their journeys, I believe that every stakeholder has a part to play, from the investors to the government to the private sector. It is really important to be able to work directly with youth and make sure that they are at the decision-making table. And I'll give an example of what Nourishing Africa is doing, working directly with SME uh, category, uh, categories in the youth um, space. And uh, we provide to them you know, an ecosystem of support from access to funding, data, markets, and even peer-to-peer -peer network with each other. And I would like to uh, make a final comment by imploring all stakeholders you know, uh, to create opportunities for youth to thrive within their networks, within their interventions. It is important to include youth in the design stage, the planning stage, the implementation stage at all stages, such that youth is represented at all stages and they can tailor many of these interventions to the requests and needs of the youth. In that way, youth can be supported all through and at every level of interventions in the food and agriculture space. Thank you so much, Claude. Thank wow, you. wonderful. Thank you, Ploy. Thank you, Ramat. This was fantastic. I just love the idea of partnerships, collaborations, capacity support, championing young people. So thank you for your good work. A lot of questions have been coming in. I want to thank the audience for engaging and for your support. We're going to take a few of our questions. A question came in from for France. Um, how can we invest in more actions on the ground with local communities? France, can you please respond to that question? Yes, I, I think there's a great opportunity for uh, some level of localization in the agro-food system because uh, if you look at, at the sometimes the problem of of access to food, uh, it's sometimes a matter of access to resources mostly uh, at the community level. And if you can leverage the skills, the knowledge, and provide uh, youth, particularly uh, from local uh, smallholder farmers, youth that are very uh, engage in the agri agriculture and, and the, ag the broader agri-food system, you have a better chance of helping where uh, it's really needed. Uh, in general, uh, the, the, the agri-food system at the local level, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult because 
or people don't they don't have the tools they don't have the skill set and if you can bring that level of of accompaniment technical accompaniment if you can provide the resources the financing that are are, are critical for local uh, communities uh, to get youth uh, to build the skills that are important we talk about sustainable agriculture and there's very uh, limited knowledge sometimes for in, in the rural areas where youth can really build on those skills. And uh, whether it's to extension services, whether it's to some uh, innovative uh, academy or ag agricultural or skills uh, development uh, program, it can really build the skills that will help youth to see agriculture as a viable pathway. Because we know there's that problem about how appealing is agriculture now for you when you're looking at the different constraints that they are facing to become active participants. So if there's that broader uh, partnership and we talk about coalition building to really help at the local level, to really support the development of the sector at the local level, whether it's uh, just uh, on farm, but also off farm, uh, 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 activities and opportunities that give them a better uh, range of opportunities and uh, help them innovate as well. Because if you look at the, the food system, the agri-food system in the broader sense, there's a lot of component, there's a lot of uh, uh, pockets of opportunities that won't be uh, available to, to youth unless they have the proper skills to really uh, integrate them and participate. And uh, also, if you're looking at all the, the uh, problems in the, we should clearly look at the, the, the waste uh, that, that's going on due to, to uh, uh, lack of logistical uh, means, you look at uh, storage problems, you look at transportation problems, there's a wide range of, 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 of issues that if you have the right investment, the programs to get you on board, you will likely uh, improve their way, the way uh, the agri-food system function and become more inclusive by engaging you, by bringing them on board to, to bring ideas, to bring solutions, but also to bring decent work that will uh, uh, improve the, the, the living conditions, but also help them to be part of, of, of the, the agri-food system as uh, economic uh, participants, uh, but also as innovators. That's where we see the needs to champion youth, the need to champion uh, young, young women, young men, and get them the skills to, to really think, do things differently where they see fit and get them the opportunity to build the skills to help fix some of the problem in the local food system. And also, sometimes also it's important that uh, new, new ways of, of, of doing things uh, are being uh, brought from the, from the ground because there's a lot of local knowledge that are already existing, but they're not sharing enough across the board. There's not that transfer, generational transfer of knowledge sometimes uh, that that is critical to make sure that the younger generation they are they are getting a stronger uh, system and they are bringing new ideas and do things differently uh, to 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 strengthen their, their their participation. Thank you so much, Franz. I mean, you are singing from our playbook. We have to engage local organizations; their voices count. We have to amplify the voices of youth. We have to share knowledge, especially indigenous knowledge. This is critical. Thank you to all our speakers. You have been fantastic. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take all your questions, but please engage with all our speakers one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, and reach out to them because ultimately we want partnerships, we want action, we want engagement, we want collaboration coming out of this. So please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to our fantastic speakers and panelists today. I'm going to hand over to my co-moderator, Sophie, to take us through the next section. The floor is yours, Sophie.
And if you weren't feeling motivated and passionate enough, in this next session, we will explore further what we hope to hear from leaders during the United Nations Food Systems Summit tomorrow. We will kick this off with a short video to hear from young people from right across the world. I want to see a global shift towards localized and equitable food systems because access to safe, nutritious, and affordable food isn't a privilege, it's a human right. Yo quiero que los líderes sean honestos y que coloquen la problemática nutricional y de seguridad alimentaria en la agenda del país como prioridad. I expect the leaders to finally take binding commitments to push forward two key agendas transparency and education so that we understand how food is grown and pushing forward restoration and resilience in order to make our planet healthy again. I ask leaders to commit to listening to and resourcing grassroots indigenous worker and producer-led organizations in determining the next steps after the summit. I want to see leaders commit to concrete and bold action on supporting the access to healthier diets and reshaping healthier food environments. And that they have transparent accountability mechanisms in place after the summit. I hope that the leaders will be and I want leaders to take bold action into incentivizing investment into alternative proteins and specifically cultured meat. We would love to see from this summit more opportunities, more commitments, more funding and promises allocated to make sure that young people have a future in agriculture and that these future young farmers and current young farmers can be the protagonists and actors in the fight for climate change. What I want as youth from the summit is the, cons is the construction of an accountability scheme for after the summit that ensures that decision makers take action on the commitments that they've made during the summit. Great messages from our youth from across the world. I'd like to open it up to you, our audience, and to ask you, what would you like to hear from the leaders during the UN Food System Summit tomorrow? Please fill in your own views through the METI poll, M-E-T-I poll, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and the code will be on your screen. We're waiting for your polls to come in. We'd love to hear from you and capture your voices. And as we wait for the polls to come in, I'd like to ask you, Sophie, because I'm no longer in the youth category, what do you hope to hear at the UNFSS tomorrow? What do you expect? What do you hope to see? What is your prayer? Didi, you are young at heart, just like all youth allies across the globe, and it has to be intergenerational. But from hearing from all those incredible young people, I'm feeling quite emotional, but I'm also feeling so, so hopeful. And hearing um, Minister McConnelly from Ireland make a really, really bold commitment to youth engagement within Irish policy and also youth support to what young people commit to doing. I hope to hear that from other ministers tomorrow. And I also hope to hear those commitments to youth engagement and youth priorities from business leaders and decision makers in all sectors. That's really powerful. And you know, it's about these youth champions, but it's also about sticking through on the pledges that have been made. And I see your responses coming through. So thank you, keep them coming, keep them coming. We want bold action. We want action that is inclusive. We want youth voices to be heard loud. We want you to be engaged through the implementation process not just in the in the dialogue process. Um, and Sophie, can you read a few of the other ones that are coming in? 
Of course, we want concrete actions that are accountable for affordable and accessible, healthy and sustainable diets for all, ambitious action that matches the scale of the challenges posed by our food system, especially on climate, a plan to restore biodiversity, that one's so incredibly important, a commitment to healthy and sustainable plant-based diets, um, a commitment to protein shift in rich, richer countries towards less meat production and plant-forward diets, but also um, transparency on the whole supply chain, commitment to restoration and resilience, financial shift to stop subsidizing deadly practices. And the list goes on, Nadidi, do you want I to love it. No, no, no. This is such a great list and we are listening, we are recording, we're going to pass this on. So thank you, young people, for your energy, your drive, your passion, your vision. And thank you for owning this agenda because the future is yours and you are the custodians of this future. So I applaud you, Sophie, and all the other young leaders who are making their voices heard and count hold us accountable to deliver on these results. Thank you so much. And again, I applaud you. Uh, Sophie, you're gonna be introducing our next segment. Yes, it's so exciting. Um, I would like to introduce, introduce our next panel made up of a mixture of young people, experts with a range of expertise, including nutrition, biodiversity, food waste, climate and livelihood perspectives on food systems. And I'd like to introduce each of our panelists to you. And then I will give them the opportunity to share a short opening statement with us on what they would like to see as outcomes from the summit tomorrow. Firstly, please join me in welcoming Claudia Sadoff, expert in water management and climate resilient development and a member of the CGIAOR System Management Board. Over to you, Claudia, for your short opening remarks. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, you're asking us in today's panel, what can we do for the leaders of tomorrow? And to my mind, the most important thing is that leaders today take a longer view, prioritizing the issues that if we neglect them now could have devastating and possibly irreversible effects on future generations. Climate is the most obvious example, but let me also call attention to the challenge of biodiversity and its connection to food systems. Many scientists, including those at CGIAR, expect that the biodiversity crisis will be as serious as the threat of climate change. One million out of the eight million species on Earth today are threatened by extinction, but there is good news. Research that's been published in Nature, contributed to by CGIAR scientists, argues that intensifying sustainable agriculture on pre-existing farms can slow biodiversity loss while also producing more nutritious foods. So now a new post-2020 global biodiversity framework is in the works, setting global targets for biodiversity conservation. CGIAR has been supporting the parties to develop evidence-based targets and to consider agrobiodiversity. Because for the framework to succeed, we need to look at how we produce, process, distribute, and consume food and promote shifts toward nature-positive agricultural practices. We can see this more holistic and systems lens being used in this discourse at the UN Food Systems Summit, and that's exciting. It chimes with the new one CGIAR vision, it's, uh, which is really an understanding that we can no longer think of solving food, land, and water system challenges in silos. And what we see on the ground through CGIR researchers and agripreneurs in programs across more than 20 countries is the enormously powerful force of youth as key agents of change in addressing all of these challenges. Thank you, Sophie. No, thank you, Claudia, um, for the incredible work CGIAR is doing um, and for highlighting the importance of uh, biodiversity restoration and also the importance of young people across the globe in this issue. Secondly, we hear from Priya Prakash, a fellow youth leader of mine and somebody I'm very proud to call a friend. She is a youth leader from India with Act for Food, Act for Change, but she is also a healthcare entrepreneur and founder and CEO 
of Health Set Go. Over to you, Priya, for your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Sophie. And um, it's just lovely to be here as a youth leader, as a youth member, and also an entrepreneur. And today we are at the Food is the Future Summit, and we cannot escape the main topic of nutrition. And that is the field that I come from. And I've been seeing that the progress to reduce undernourishment and micronutrient deficiencies has been extremely slow um, across the last couple of years. And there is a long way to go if we need to achieve the SDGs by 2030. The prevalence of overweight and obesity is increasing in all countries, especially in a country like India. 821 million people are chronically undernourished. Children under the age of five are stunted, over 150 million children, and so on and so forth. So when we hear these statistics and we hear how the young people of our world are actually suffering from some of these problems, which in the future can lead to non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, we need to think of a very long-term perspective, and there need to be major changes in how we are addressing these problems. Because many of the issues that are there today are faced by young people, we also need to have the solutions by young people. Because today's youth will be the decision makers of tomorrow. We will be the residents of the planet for decades to come. And young people today are demanding these changes from businesses, from governments to improve health and well-being, to improve food security and nutrition. And we have already seen that this is the decade of youth activism. So what I would like to see from the summit is that youth as a collective force are represented. We are together through activism, through entrepreneurship, through movements, actually solving some of these global problems and that we are getting a seat at the table so that we can have better health and well-being and a good uh, future of food. Yes, Priya, say it loud and say it clear so the people in the back can hear us. We want to see it at the table. We're committed, we're ready, we're passionate, and we are here. We're already doing the work. But we also want to work with others and have an intergenerational solution that looks long term. And thank you so much for highlighting this. Next, we will have uh, Jai Kun Lu join us from China. He is founder and CEO of Clear Plate and uh, an app that rewards people for reducing food waste. He is also one of the United Nations Young Leaders on the Sustainable Development Goals. Wow, welcome to the stage. The floor is yours for your opening remarks. Hi, thank you for the warm introduction. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Jichun from China, and, and I'm, I'm very excited to join this event. I think this is a great opportunity for us to boost our creativity towards a more sustainable food system. Uh, in 2018, I started an app called Clear Plate. I uh, aims to reduce food waste. After a meal, users uh, take photos of their plate through this app. And once the image is recognized by AI as no food waste, uh, the users will get points and they can use these points to redeem gifts or make donations to charity meals. Now, by offering rewards uh, for saving food, we have already 5 million users and 70% of them are young people, especially uh, students in, on campus. And many of them are also working on uh, combating food waste problems. Uh, and uh, last year, we worked together with uh, WIP China and launched a uh, Stop the Waste campaign. Uh, it attracted uh, 500 million views on Chinese social media, Weibo, and several celebrities ser served as ambassadors. Uh, I want to summarize that uh, we need uh, these young people to continue advocating and pushing for a better world for all. I think for a more sustainable food system, the answer is simple. Engagement is the key for change. You can start from uh, saving food, starting from clearing your plate for every meal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jishin. 500 million views. That's absolutely 
astounding and it also shows the appetite young people have to create food system change especially through something as creative as what you have created in china and that engagement is obviously so key to the change that you're making fourthly i would like to introduce sandrine dixon declave co-chair of Action Track 5 and co-president of the Club of Rome. She was previously chief partnership officer of the United Nations Agency Sustainable Energy for All, among many other roles and wearing many different hats. Uh, Sandrine, over to you. Sophie, it's so good to see you again. And the last time we were together was, of course, eating in Rome at the pre-summit. And I just want to congratulate all the youth that have been behind this incredible event, because clearly you are the leaders of today, alongside what we hope will be real leadership from many others. And, and what I feel is most important to say to all of you is let's make sure that we hold ourselves and all leaders accountable for ensuring that actually the food system truly does become sustainable. We have to act as leaders and address these incredible commitments that you were reading off so that we can truly emerge from emergency. The Club of Rome, and many of you probably don't know, 50 years ago already started to talk about limits to growth. And, and now we're talking about what I call the three C's, climate change, COVID and conflict. And the only way that we can shift from these three C's is to get to the three P's, people, planet, and prosperity. We need a systems approach, and that's why the Food System Summit tomorrow has to ensure that it delivers to that food system to make it actually truly sustainable. The Food is the Future event that you've all been working so hard on should be an opportunity for all of us to send a positive message of hope through concrete actions building on all the efforts that we've done together, all the solutions that we've brought together. And in particular in the resilience track, we're seeing these striking examples of resilient, resilience within very fragile and conflict settings. Often we have heard from young men and women who are on the front lines of conflict zones or most vulnerable to climate that have already been engaging in ensuring that people have access to food, not only nutritious food, but food full stop because food should be a universal right and that is what we claim within the resilience track. We've also seen that through COVID-19, it's often young people that have also been on the front lines in ensuring that people have access, that people also are uh, working towards meals at schools, etc. So for us, building resilience will mean building peace and social cohesion. This is the conduit through which channeling the energy of the youth is so important from the Sahel or from Yemen or from the Horn. And this is already happening today. You as youth are innovating, resisting, adapting and providing solidarity. You are incredible examples to all of us and together we're going to build this resilience at scale. But what we need to do is break down the silos, move away from linear thinking, start to go beyond artificial continuums. We need to call for integration and a combination and optimization of different actions. What I'm saying to you, coming also from our planetary emergency plan at the Club of Rome, is to ensure that one, we access to food is given as a universal right, that we also enhance local production for local consumption, that we ensure that we look at climate development pathways as the way to truly bring carbon back into the soil, to ensure that we look at the land, water, and food nexus, and to look at the way in which we protect biodiversity. That we put in place the right modalities for financing, and we have to hold accountable governments to ensure that they put food at the center of the way in which they engage with people, and therefore put forward a series of different solutions with regard to enhancing capital flows toward nutritious and also access to food. This should also be done through one of the proposals that we have in the Food Stability Board to ensure that we actually do continuously put food at the center of our thinking and at the center of a stable system. And finally, let me conclude that we need to ensure that we build on all the incredible partnerships that we've already started through the summit and the process. 
that we bring together all the local solutions, global solutions, and national solutions into decision making. We have to transform our energy agricultural systems at the same time if we want to meet our 2030 decade of action, in particular for decarbonization. And that means we're going to have to agree to have the consumption and production footprints in developed and emerging economies and bring energy and agriculture chains, value chains, into the midst of this by internalizing externalities, enhancing regenerative land use, halting unsustainable natural resource explo exploitation, and including rare earth, minerals, as well as the recognition of the social and ecological impact from the worldwide use of resources, not only from industry, but from the food production system. So my call to all of you as we are here today is keep active and thank you for everything that you do. You have to hold all leaders accountable, but I'm thanking you as well for already showing such incredible leadership. Thank you, Sandrine, for showing leadership over the past 50 years with the Club of Rome, really leading this change to where we are today and hopefully to where we will be in the future. What you were saying was giving me goosebumps and thank you for also bringing uh, people in conflict zones into the conversation because we haven't heard that yet and it is of utmost importance and these people sometimes don't have or being given the space or cannot have the space to speak. So thank you for speaking on behalf of them. This is extremely important. I'd like everybody to keep people who cannot be in the room today in their minds as we move forward in our conversation. And I'd like to move straight into our questions from the audience because they're really coming in. Um, Claudia, um, Alan Kundal made a very interesting comment. How can we in global debates take into account that climate and biodiversity contexts are so different in developing countries compared to the situation in developed countries? That is a fantastic question, Alan and, and Sophie. Um, as a member of the executive management team and a managing director at CGIR, which is the largest publicly funded network of agricultural research for development institutions, let me share some of our thinking. We focus as a research for development organization on small scale farmers and the farmers in developing nations who are those that are really on the front lines of, of climate uh, poverty equity issues that we're all managing. So we're working very hard to try to anchor food systems with a smallholder farmer perspective into the solution space of several of the ongoing global dialogues. So in climate, for example, we're working hard to say that we need to look beyond a focus on fuels. We've done, I think, a great job as a, in an international community raising concerns there. But a recent Nature article has suggested that even if we stopped using all fossil fuels today, we still couldn't reach our Paris targets without transforming our food systems. So we're working hard to make sure that that transformation serves the needs of the vulnerable and the poor, and CGIR will be very active at the upcoming Glasgow Climate COP. With regard to biodiversity, as I said uh, in my opening remarks, agriculture can be such a driver in both directions uh, when it comes to impacts on biodiversity. So CGIR is being very active in the CBD, the upcoming con uh, Convention on Biological Diversity COP next month. Again, to bring forward the perspective of small farmers, which, which do differ from those of uh, large scale farming in, in the West. And also in discussions around equity and prosperity, we know that agriculture is the primary employer of the poor. And we see that investment in the agriculture sector can have three to four times the poverty impact of investment in other sectors. So at CGIR, we're working very hard at that science policy interface. For example, last week, engaging at the G20 agriculture ministers meeting in, in Italy, we're working hard to ensure that these commitments are made with a view to the voices of small scale farmers in the developing worlds and to ensure that the commitments to science and very importantly, the commitment to partnerships in the developing world across generations, across countries are there because that's the way we're going to make real change. Thanks, Sophie. 
Thank you, Claudia. And I've just heard that we have the um, another amazing youth leader in the room, Webster McCombe, and he's somebody who really knows about holding governments and decision makers to account. He is a Scaling Up Nutrition and Act for Food, Act for Change youth leader in Zimbabwe. The floor is yours, Webster. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sophie, and I'm really happy to be part of this conversation today and just to talk about how um, food is the future. And I think we can just um, get the whole idea of what we'd want to do from the, you know, from the name of, of, of the event itself by saying food is the future. And in that way, we are able then to understand that food is the driving force and the center force that we need in order to... Um, to you know especially to get the agenda agenda 20 agenda 2030 particularly when you talk about the sustainable um development goals so now looking for sdg1 to sdg17 we cannot then get to achieve all those goals if we do not put um food on the center stage of of everything that we do particularly when it comes to the issue of you know changing the dynamics of our food systems or how um you know or how we carry around uh food from farming to distribution and also to to consumption and so as a as a youth leader for nutrition and a, and as a youth advocate i really think um all of us we have a part to play in getting to achieve these things but the most important thing would be to engage with parliamentarians and key decision makers so that we are able to um, uh, fully transform our, our, our food system that have the, the capacity and, and the keys like and, and I might be passionate as I can be, I might have all the youthful will that I can, I, I can have, but I'd not have the reins of power to, you know, to put all those things um, in, in motion. So by acknowledging that food is the future and that young people are the future, what we then need to understand is that between those two components, there's then a third component, which is the government and decision uh, makers who have the power uh, you know, to connect the food is the future and the youth is the future and just support us and help propel, um, propel us forward. Yeah. So that's all I have to say is my, um, is my opening marks uh, for today. But um, sort of just, just to close up, uh, we, really have, we also have to focus on the Nutrition for Growth Summit that's going to take place um, in December and also realizing this the decade of action uh, for nutrition and with the understanding that nutrition uh, is the fuel that drives the SDGs. So we have to do uh, all we can, especially by helping young people. Thank you so much, Webster. Food is the future. Youth is the future. We are. Um, and we're lively and we're here and we're, we're ready to work with, with others, um, which is incredibly important. I'm going to come back to Priya for a minute for another question. Um, what do you think is the most important aspect in the follow-up of the United Nations Food Systems Summit tomorrow? Yes, uh, thanks for that question, Sophie. I think, um, first of all, I am uh, extremely uh, happy with the progress that's been made to include youth in these conversations. I think the fact that we are having so many young leaders in the mix today is a great domino effect. And I know that tomorrow in the UNFSS as well, there is going to be a lot of youth engagement. At least we are being given that voice and being given the priority. And it would be great, according to me, if everything did not end there. You know, the UNFSS is there for a reason. It's a huge event. Everyone will be coming together to discuss the priorities for the next 10 years till 2030. But it should not be something that happens once a year. And then after that, we forget about these priorities. I think the UNFSS is a place that uh, will be the starting point for the next one year until, of course, we reach the summit again. But during that time, can we see some of these changes actually being made? So what I'd like to see in terms of the outcome is that some of these demands that, you know, we as youth want from governments, from businesses, if those demands are heard, if some of those things are worked upon beyond the UNFSS beyond having everything as what we call tokenism, where youth are represented, it would be great to see these things in action. And I know that because we, uh, for the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign, we have 
more than 70,000 young people who have pledged, who have committed that they are going to act. And there are so many countries involved. So I would love to see what comes out after the UNFSS, where people are actually making actions on the ground, where young people in schools, universities are talking about the food systems. They're talking about a healthy way to do things. And that is, for me, more exciting um, than tomorrow's event. So if that can be a great outcome where young people around the world are rallying for the next one year until the next summit, I think that is something that I would love to see. Thank you so much, Priya. I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned about a healthier way of doing things. And as we look towards COP26, we have had a really interesting question come in for Sandrine. How to bring, how do you bring biodiversity in the monoculture agriculture? Well, that's why we need to shift from monoculture agriculture. It's a pretty easy, uh, easy sell. And, and it's an easy sell, not only because we're protecting other species, but we need to remember the Ubuntu philosophy, which is that we are nature and nature is us. This is not just about protection of nature. This is about the protection of ourselves as a human species. So the way in which we do that concretely is to work with farmers that have agroecology and regenerative agriculture practices to ensure that we stop subsidizing what actually are subsidies for industrial agriculture that is destroying our soil and destroying our local production methods and that we enhance all of the investments into much more local production methods that are looking at agroecology or regenerative agriculture. We've seen, I don't know if some of you have seen the incredible film, Kiss the Ground, but we're now seeing that even across the United States, farmers have come to the realization that they have been spoon fed fertilizers and chemicals that are destroying their crops and their lands. In Africa, we're seeing that actually by pushing GMOs and also more chemicals, this is not helpful to the people and to the production of their local resources. So we, we need to start really pushing back on large scale industrial agriculture that does not do the right thing. We need to put in place the infrastructure, the subsidy structures and start to shift so that we are really promoting those agricultural practices. There are many movements and the exciting thing about the pre-food system summit, but also some of the declarations that are coming out and the way in which we brought through some of these solutions is that smallholders, farmers, but also big companies, Walmart in the United States and also other types of grocery stores are now demanding these types of solutions. Creating that demand will start to really shift this system away from those types of agricultural practices that are not helping either biodiversity or even the way in which we ourselves survive. So I'm really hopeful that through the work that we've been able to do in the pre-summit, but also all the work as Priya said, everything starts now. This is the departure lounge for a total shift in the way in which we engage with the food system. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you to make that happen. Wow, thank you so much, Sandrine. This is the Departure Lounge and we are ready to go and we are ready to act. We are our nature and our nature is us. I love that. And now we will go on to our next section. That was just an amazing session. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you to all the leaders, the youth leaders, leaders who are doing amazing work for your passion, your commitment, your drive. I am inspired. I am encouraged. I'm pumped uh, for what we are going to see tomorrow. But beyond tomorrow, what we're going to see over the next 
year and decade as we ensure food for all, good food for all, and we put climate and people, farmers at the center. Thank you for your great work. Um, this has just been an amazing session. And for our final session of the day, we have an exciting lineup of introductions to initiatives we'd like to share with you. There's just been so much going on over the last year. Firstly, we'd like to hear from the Action Track chairs about their consortium initiative. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lawrence Haddad, chair of Action Track One, an executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition Gain. I happen to be a proud board member of Gain, and I want to give a special shout out to Lawrence for ensuring an inclusive dialogue in Action Track One, ensuring the youth voice is heard, women's voices are heard marginalized and vulnerable groups are heard. I mean, Lawrence, you have been an amazing Action Track One leader and I applaud you from the bottom of my heart. I just think you're so exemplary and you didn't pay me to say this, it's coming from my heart. And then we have Sandrine Dixon, Declare, the co-chair of Action Track 5 and co-president of the Club of Rome. We've just heard her speak so passionately. And uh, Sandrine, you are amazing. So I'm just excited to have both of you speak to each other on this coalition and this consortium. Over to you, Lawrence and Sandrine. Thank you. Go ahead, Lawrence. The floor is yours. I think I think you're you're on first, Sandrine. But, okay. Uh, that's no, that's fine. I can start. Um, listen, Ndidi, thank you so much. Um, all the action track chairs have been absolutely amazing, and we've all uh, riffed off of each other, and we've all tried to um, to learn from each other how to be inclusive and 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 listen and uh, just just to to be what the summit deserves. So thank you for that, Ndidi. Um, I think Sandrine and I, Martin was Martin Frick sends his apologies. He can't be with us today. He's actually sleeping right now because he's in New York. But Sandrine and I are going to do a uh, a little show for you to tell you a little bit about uh, Food Forward, the Food Forward Coalition. Um, we've only got nine harvests until 2030. We're we're really on a I think I like to call it a sprint marathon until 2030. And we're on the run we're on the starting line, and we we need to get our running shoes on, and we need to move fast. We need to move together. We we only have these nine harvests. We must break the unhealthy, unsustainable, unjust, and frankly dangerous trajectories that our food systems are on. Uh, so the time has come now to transform food systems. And what does that mean? Well, it means the kinds of things we're doing. Unprecedented mobilization of will. Joe Biden's 10 billion yesterday is a good start, but we need the G7, the G20, China, Europe, you name it. We need much more than 10 billion to get this thing going. And we also need not just money, we need mindset shifts and we need partnership shifts, and we need evidence shifts that will guide us. So this is what the Food Forward Consortium is all about, unprecedented collaboration for action. Now, turning to you, Sandrine, Sandrine, how would you say this process towards the summit has helped set the stage for this big shift, this change of gear? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, as I just said, Lawrence, in, in the last engagement, which was full of youthful voices, this is just the departure lounge. We, as Action Track leads, tried to bring together, as we were asked to, such incredible public momentum behind providing new solutions. And we gathered those solutions and we tried as Action Track chairs also to work jointly, as Lawrence says, to create that mind shift, to actually look at the system as an integrated system, to bring this powerful menu of solutions to draw from and then put together brand new radical new partnerships through these coalitions that are really committed now to tackling our greatest food system challenges and ensuring that the future food system is much more sustainable, it's healthy, it's equitable, and it's resilient. And as Sophie just said, we need to make sure when we do that, that we bring in the entire world, those that are also most vulnerable and on the front lines and don't even have access to food. So the UN Food System Summit tomorrow is an endpoint of sorts, and that's why I talked about a departure lounge. 
this is the moment when we actually really truly begin to work together actively across the globe at the local level at the national level and at the global level this is when the hard work starts this is when we all need to ramp up the action deliver real change to ensure that we really optimize all of our networks our intergenerational networks and partnerships that we've created for long-term impact so mm -hmm. The key now is going to be getting the balance between the short-term levers for change and the long-term systems change, which is really the optimal goal. Yeah, and it's been pretty clear to us as Action Track chairs, I think, over the last 12 months that while, while smaller steps are important, they can add up to meaningful improvements, they're no longer enough. I mean, we, we can't just be tweaking the system. We need transformative change. So I think there have been a number of mindset shifts, and I, I keep talking about the mindset shifts, because that unlocks the action, that unlocks the policy, the practice, the resources, uh, the partnerships. It's no longer good enough to say we're going to improve nutrition if we, uh, if it's one step forward on nutrition and two steps backwards on biodiversity, right? That's not good enough. It's no longer good enough to just look at policies, programs, and resources. We need to look one, two levels down. What is it, what is it what's driving our policies and practices and resources to that. One of the things we've identified, all of us, is the true value, true cost, mm -hmm. true benefits of different food choices. We need to start factoring in those huge hidden costs and hidden benefits of different food choices and make those make that the basis, the new currency for decision-making by governments, by businesses, by investors, and by consumers. So, Sandrine, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to help everybody move forward? I think, I think Lawrence, you're so right. And I think that the exciting thing here is we've also learned through COVID that we can transform. We've, we've learned that actually there have been new ways of engaging with the food system when actually it was much more difficult to ensure that people could have food on their plates. And that transformation has been incredible in allowing us to also see that through creative energy and forward momentum, we, we actually can generate all of these, this excitement with different organizations and joint forces. Um, this has been evidenced through the action tracks, and it's been so incredible to work with the action track chairs, including yourself. Uh, together, we've been able to mobilize this global community across multilateral governance, uh, organizations, academia, civil services, society, and businesses. And, and really, I think that this is a force for change, and we need to bring more people with us. We need to show that food is at the center of all of our lives and get people on the journey and excited about, as you say, the opportunities, but really understanding how we need to do things differently, like mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, as Six Action Track organizations, because now we're no longer just Six Action Track chairs, we're actually organizations, GAIN, EAT, WWF, Pair, the Club of Rome, and ECAD are launching this Food Forward Consortium. And I love the fact that we've talked about Food Forward. And that will be what will join us together over these next nine harvests. And we will try to deliver and get support from their national, local governments, and other key food system stakeholders in driving the fundamental shifts that we've all jointly declared are fundamental. Thanks, Sandrine. I really like that name too because it, it sort of suggests we put food forward in, in everyone's minds, in, in everyone's actions, in everyone's policies, but it also stresses the, the fast forward nature, the, the mm. fact that we, we we're, in a, we're in a marathon, but we have to move fast in this marathon. Um, what are we actually going to do? Well, we, we, we haven't worked it all out yet because we're, we're in the business of uh, co-creation, as we all say. But we think they're going to be sort of two interconnected work streams, a, a global work stream and a country work stream. The country work stream will be you know, national and local, and they'll feed into each other and, and, and riff off of each other. The global work stream will really focus on, amongst other things, really trying to get this idea of true value of food metric into to, to make it non-scary, to make it non-technical, uh, to make people actually make it something that people can actually use. Uh, and that's the only way we're really going to break the logjam of this. You know, we we kind of get the food systems that our prices tell us we should get. 
Uh, so we need to change the prices. Prices at the national level, we're going to take these these priority pathways, these transformation pathways that have come out of the dialogues. We're going to take them as the Bible. They are going to be the things that that drive the consortium at the country level. The country level is where I think there's most uh, talk, but not enough action from organizations like our own. And so we have we've committed to making change and supporting change and facilitating change and championing change at the country level, working very closely with governments and national partners. Because if we can do it, if we can, if it can happen over a five year period in in some exemplar places, then we can show, we can inspire, we can uh, help others to, to emulate that. Sandrine, um, over to you. Yeah, and then I think we've we've got our lovely chair who's back, so she's probably yeah. wanting us to to move on. In Didi, I I will conclude on just, yes. on just indicating exactly as Lawrence said that this is going to be very much an exciting process, and we know that we cannot build back better. I don't believe in building back. You cannot build glaciers. You cannot build some biodiversity loss. But we can move forward and we can ensure that this is going to be one of the most exciting consortiums of partners, governments, potential funders and other stakeholders that we will be discussing with. It'll be an iterative practice and an iterative process. And we've started this together, but it's only a start. We are now moving from that departure lounge and we're taking off. I've got my my moon mission here to show that we are taking off. This is a mission for the food system so that we can properly transform it together. Nine harvests is what we've been saying, and that's our goal. Let's make it happen. Let's shoot for the stars, Sandrine, and let's do it with our youth champions. You've got it. Thank you, Ndidi. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sandrine. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you for the momentum. Thank you for the collaboration. Thank you for the vision and passion. Nine harvests, and with you at the helm of leadership, partnering across the globe, on the country level, at the local level, with local institutions, empowering the youth and the local institutions to actually act. I am confident that we'll have a lot to celebrate and that the next nine harvest will truly be glorious. Each one building on the other one, momentum, ensuring that no one is left behind. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our leaders, action track leaders, and to all those who have worked behind the scenes. We're getting closer and closer to the end, so please stick with us. We're gonna now show you a range of videos on initiatives that plan to drive the agenda for the UN Food System Summit forward. We'll revisit the Eat Lancet guidelines and hear from Johan Rockstore and the Eat Lancet 2.0. Johan will be followed by Eat for Change, an initiative from the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. We'll then hear for Act for Food, Act for Change, a global youth-led campaign, the Food Systems Monitoring Countdown Project, as explained by Jess Fanzo, and last but not least, the initiative Food at COP, a youth-led campaign for climate-friendly food at the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26. All these initiatives are ph phenomenal, and once again, I applaud the leaders behind these initiatives and all those acting to drive change. Keep up the good work. We're proud of you, and we look forward to celebrating the milestones as we move forward. God bless you all. Let's hear the videos. Nothing threatens planetary health and people's health as much as the broken food system. 25% of greenhouse gas emissions caused by the food system. Biodiversity loss is primarily caused by exploiting and expansion of agriculture. And up to 10 million people die prematurely because of unhealthy food. Food will determine the future of humanity on Earth. That is why we launched the first Eat Lancet Commission to try for the first time to gather scientists across different disciplines to define quantitative safe targets for a healthy diet from sustainable food systems as a universal guide for a transition towards a healthy future for humanity on planet Earth. Now is the time after the 2019 launch of the first report to work towards the scientific update. Science is rushing forward. We have so much new evidence and moreover, the universal planetary health diet 
needs to be translated into manageable focus on solutions in the diversity of cultures and geographies across the world. I also foresee that the planetary health diet can now be used in order to really be a solution towards dealing with the climate crisis, but even with the pandemic reduction strategies we have in the future. We know that pandemics are predominantly zoonosis, viral spillovers from nature, via domestic animals to humans. A planetary health diet can help us to build resilience in nature and in climate to reduce risks of future pandemics. So we need a new Eat Lancet 2.0 to update the science, but also to explore acceleration and transformative pathways for a true journey back to a safe operating space for humanity on planet Earth, both in terms of health, but also in terms of planetary stability. This is why we now take up the baton for the second Eat Lancet Commission work. we produce and eat is the single largest human pressure on nature. To achieve food systems which protect nature while ensuring everyone has enough nutritious food, we need a global transition to healthy and sustainable diets. And that's what Eat for Change is all about. Everyone has a role to play. Eating planet-based is our superpower to fight climate change, reverse nature loss and help feed more people. We can also have an impact beyond our own plate. Achieving sustainable food systems needs system level change. Eat for Change is a consortium of 13 organizations and a network of active youth around Europe and Latin America. With trainings, an online platform, youth summits, campaigns run by our partners and more, we empower youth to challenge decision makers and businesses, engage their peers, to build a better future one bite at a time. Hunger and malnutrition. Climate change. Unsafe food. Deforestation. Poverty. Soil erosion. Inequality. Human rights violations and abuses. Food systems adds to these problems. We are the future. The young generations. But our future is uncertain. Food. Environment. People. We are all connected. Our beautiful planet. Should nourish us. Food shouldn't kill us. Food doesn't have to cost the earth. Food can be a way to create. Not to destroy. To learn and to honor and to protect our past and our future to build mutual respect fairness understand collaboration we must act for food and act for change so we can have good food for all we can pledge we can act we can change our world join the movement for better food systems Hi, my name is Jess Fonzo and I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University. In partnership with 27 academic institutions, NGOs, and UN agencies, we've brought together food system experts to work on what we call the Food Systems Monitoring Countdown Project. The idea of the project is to propose a rigorous science-based monitoring framework to support evidence-based policymaking and guide public and private decisions and support those who are holding decision makers accountable towards food systems transformation. What we've done is we've worked on a framework and we're publishing it this October. Over the next several years, 
we are going to be selecting and tracking indicators for analysis of food systems performance and accountability over the next decade with an end goal of 2030, the SDGs. So our next steps, we are going to be vetting indicators. We're going to be refining a list of indicators and doing some analysis on those indicators into what we hope is a yearly or an every other year publication that goes through a peer review process. We are opening ourselves up to different uh, stakeholders and collaborators to join us, help us come up with a monitoring framework that will help in the accountability process towards better food systems transformation. Hi, my name is Silke, and together with others, I founded the Food at Talk campaign. We are an international youth-led grassroots initiative advocating for climate-friendly menus at major international conferences. Our current target is campaigning for plant-based catering at COP26. The objective of the conference is clear, and this ambition needs to be reflected in the logistics of the event as well. Our campaign aims to spur a conversation on what foods we choose to produce and eat, considering our Earth's limited resources. As a society, we must ensure that individuals can make good choices without putting the planet at risk. Therefore, we need to mainstream plant-based food options. Reducing the overall impact of a conference by ordering plant-based and climate-friendly food is easy to implement, has a direct impact and symbolizes immediate action at a summit that is mainly about talking. Vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts and seeds are proven to be less impactful on the planet than meat, dairy and most seafood. In addition, they're good for your body and mind. We have discussed so much about food today. Let's embrace the riches of nature. Let's eat tasty, healthy, diverse and inclusive meals all together at the next in-person conference. Be good to your planet. Be good to yourself. Wow, those were some incredible initiatives. And these are only a few initiatives that are ongoing from right across the globe. And as an app for food, app for change, core group youth leader, I'm so proud of the campaign. And I'd also like to recognize all the people working tirelessly that you don't see, such as the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Food Foundation, Irish Aid and the FCDO who have supported our campaign um, since the beginning. But it's really exciting to see all these initiatives focus on accountability, ensuring momentum towards the summit and also ensuring that food systems will be brought into different debates over the coming year. And as we are reaching the end of this session, I would like to thank my incredible co-moderator Nadidi for the excellent co-moderation. I'd also like to thank all our speakers and everybody that attended at home. We appreciate your input and your questions and hope that you will stay engaged tomorrow and the coming year in food systems transformation and beyond. Um, to wrap up, um, our session completely, I would like to introduce two incredible youth leaders who are also part of what's called the Youth Liaisons Group, which is a accountability and youth constituency mechanism that has been set up by the United Nations Food Systems Summit. We have Pramisha Thapalia and Mike Kunga. Mike is a nutrition professional and has been a leading voice inside and outside of Malawi to address the problem of high levels of malnutrition. He is also one of the driving forces behind Act for Food, Act for Change. Pramisha is a UN Food System Summit youth ambassador, passionate about youth engagement and mobilization, specifically in relation to climate change food and agriculture. And I'm so excited to know you both personally and really proud of everything you guys have achieved together with the youth constituency. Over to you. Well, thanks so much, Sophie, for the introduction. I mean, my name is Mike Kunga. Aside from the leader for Act for Food Act for Change, I'm also a vice chair for Action Track 5 of the UN Food System Summit. 
and I've been engaged in the summit since the beginning. And it was a wonderful experience up to now, uh, realizing that we can promote food systems even in fragile and conflict zones because I was the I'm the vice chair of Action Track 5 of the food systems which focus on resilience. So as a matter of fact, working and staying in Malawi, I've realized that in my lifetime, my country has faced and continue to face problems of malnutrition and food insecurity, particularly due to climate change. Because with the rising of drought and high temperatures, uh, populations of Malawi cannot afford access to food. But the question is, are the countries like Malawi have really contributed very less in terms of climate change? and have the disaster being sought by them? Absolutely not. But you tend to realize that children and young people in Malawi will continue to reap the consequences of bad climate. And the question is, should we really point fingers at each other that we are the cause and you are not the cause of the climate change? Absolutely not. Food system issues that we are facing today are not only high income or low income issues. These are global and systematic issues. And we need to rise together with the understanding that our problems are interconnected and our hope is intertwined and more importantly, working with young people. And as a matter of fact, young people have, are already aware of these systematic issues and are taking actions from grassroots and up to policy level to really drive the change. Whether we get recognized or not, and whether we get support or not, we will continue to work hard in, in terms of building our food systems and helping to achieve our goals. And it's high time right now that we realize the potential of 1.8 billion young people across the world. And we need to showcase, and we're not allowed to be as a showcased puppet in your project or your agendas, but we demand to be integrated in the policy implementation and as a matter of fact, in the action itself. And more, more than anything now and urgently, we need young people to champion food system change. And of course, we are hopeful that this is going to change. And our actions, people, our actions of young people right now gives us hope and also the hope that people in power are capable of realizing the product role of young people in achieving the, glow, the goals and joining us in action. Thanks so much. Prime Minister can continue from this. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You have covered most of the part. <laughs> Uh, it, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Pramisha Thapolia, and uh, I come from a small country, Nepal, where more than 65% of the population depend upon agriculture for a living. But it is quite unfortunate to share that uh, malnutrition and food security still remain some of our biggest problems. Uh, the list of uh, problems in my country continues. The poor livelihoods of small widow farmers and indigenous communities Diversion from agriculture to non-agricultural employment sector, degradation of soil health, increased dependency to multinational food and agricultural corporations, child malnutrition, land degradation, climate change impacts on fair food trade and many more. And uh, this is also true for most of the developing countries. I would not have to worry about these issues if the previous generations had imagined the future with just and equitable food systems. And we don't want our children and grandchildren to give us this same blame. We have a food systems emergency, although no one wants to talk about it, especially power holders, because the current system perfectly suits them. However, the real vulnerable population is facing this daily who are on the ground working tirelessly to make a living. The game of power dynamics must not be played at the expense of the rights of people. Today, I want to tell you two things. First, now is the time to lead the change. So be that change in your lifetime. Don't wait for others. Remember how beautiful humanity could be again if we all act with clear intentions. You are in this world for a reason and don't waste this opportunity. Second, young people are your ally if you really want a change. Listen to them and support their work. Go through the priorities of young people for food systems and act now, act for food, act for change, and act for future. Food is the future. That's what today's event has been called because our food systems are saving our future, whether we like it or not. 10 years from now, I don't know where I will be or what I will be doing, but I want to see my children speaking at the Food is the Present event 
and not the food is the future event. For youths in the third decade of the 21st century, we can do better. We can be part of something bigger, a movement of all youths across the world for better food systems that deliver on their promises to nourish people and the planet. Act for food, act for change, act for future. Thank you.